NAGPRA big concern to the tribes, but not the government. Barnaby, can you? I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. I don't know what happened, but uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish the prayer first and, and then uh, we'll go from there. Now, the Gamati Dadi is the Tak, the Jukitan, give one Tak, Apache the Agadam is the Ramasai, but how much bit of Jok Nankamamsak, who much comes Nankamamsak, or the Mutabo Jok is doing it about either Governor Tanya. Boba, the Nagra, Muslim, and see how your Baba verses, which is from Asaudi, the Guru Ganka, Mumach of Muslim trick, which is from Sasak at Word, which but why is in Jabab journey, but you touch him with verses to a Jew, stop it dark to be Eve that the Masma Matam did a Napo with Jew, I suffered room yaw, a Masma E Matam did, first night you suffer a woo, a word did verse it, a Masma E Matverse is a word. Okay, stop that. Come, still, you come bound to get up. Boy, get that. Who's the aid? And she touch a coy tie. I had you word it. Who's the aid? And my tie. Who can word it? Thank you. I got uh, mixed up with the anyway. The zoom, I'm trying to get back on. It looks like I left it. I can't see anybody, but I know I can hear you. So you can go ahead and continue, and I'll try to log on again. Okay, yes, we, we can definitely see you and hear you. Great. Okay, well, maybe I'll just leave it like it is. Thank you very much, Barnaby. Before we begin with our first agenda item, um, I would like to note that the review committee is very interested in receiving comments from anyone in attendance on progress made or barriers encountered in implementing NAGPRA. If you are interested in providing a public comment during this meeting or at future meetings, please let me know when I ask for public comment. At that time, I will turn on the chat feature for this meeting or you can raise your hand to request a time to make public comment. The first item on the agenda today is the selection of a chair and vice chair. Selection of a chair for this committee is required by the act and the committee's charter. Under current meeting procedures, the chair serves a term of two years with no limits on the number of terms. Under revised meeting procedures adopted by the committee in August, the committee must also select a vice chair to serve in place of the chair when needed and for the same two year term. The designated federal official um, may also administratively oversee the meeting if needed. How would the committee like to proceed? At this time, I'll turn the discussion con concerning the selection of a chair over to you. Uh, please be sure that you identify yourself before you speak so those calling in can identify your voice. This is Frank. Um, why don't we go ahead and proceed with the election? Are there any members that wish to be considered as the chair and vice chair? Well, I will put myself forward then for either of those positions as one possible candidate. But we need another volunteer, at least, I think. I'll volunteer for vice chair, but not for chair.
and anybody else want to be considered? Oh, well then, um, Madam DFO, what do we do in this case? Do we move forward with the two, two possible candidates here or? Um, yes, since uh, we have a, a, a clear selection, um, I guess I would just ask if there are any objections from any members of the committee. No objection, this is Barnaby. Barnaby, did you, did, did you put yourself forward just now or did you say go forward? I, no, no, he <laughs> said he did not object. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, well then um, in uh, case of the chair uh, position, um, I guess we need to do uh, person by person or we do this by? No, we. Uh, this is sufficient um, as long as there are no um, objections to the selection of Frank McManaman as chair and Tim McEwen as vice chair. We can proceed. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you all on my behalf at least. Tim, I don't know if you have any words you'd like to partake of. Um, I just want to thank uh, everybody for your support and um, hopefully we can move ahead in a expeditious fashion. So, likewise. So we hope this will all go smoothly and, and very well for everybody concerned. Uh, in that case, as a chair, um, I would ask our DFO and the National NAGPRA uh, program director to take up the second order of business on our agenda, the uh, report, program report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you all are aware, uh, the NAGPRA program has many delegated responsibilities um, that we are able to carry out in large part due to our dedicated staff. Um, it is uh, just me here with, with Lisa on the screen, but there are several other members of the NAGPRA program um, and our small but mighty team carries out these responsibilities to the best of their ability. And certainly over the last two years, the staff have adapted their business process to meet these new challenges of telework. I would like to announce today, in addition to our small but mighty team, David Barlin Lyles has been selected as the first full-time investigator for the National NAGPRA program. The investigator is responsible for providing staff assistance to support the civil penalty responsibilities of the Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks. David's National Park Service career began in 1989 and has included 25 years of law enforcement as a park ranger, special agent, and law enforcement program manager. David served as the case agent for a distinguished team that successfully resolved the theft of indigenous human remains from the museum collections at Effigy Mounds National Monument by the unit superintendent in 1990. This purposeful and heinous act circumvented the provisions of NAGPRA and prevented repatriation to descendants for over two decades. David's tenacity, innovation, professionalism, and perceptiveness led to a criminal conviction, improved government to government relationships with the affected tribes and resulted just very recently in the proper repatriation and reburial of those ancestors at effigy mounds. Lance Foster, the vice chairman of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, sent me a, a message about David's selection. Lance says, we congratulate the wise choice in selecting David Barlin Lyles for this position because he has proved his ability both in investigation of missing ancestral remains and through his cultural understanding and friendship to the tribes involved in the Effigy Mounds case. I'm very pleased um, to tell you that David will be joining us um, in the National NAGPRA program um, to work as an investigator on allegations of failure to comply. Once again, I'd like to commend our staff um, at the National NAGPRA program um, for all of their efforts 
uh, that have helped us to uphold our responsibilities. If you're, um, those of you who are in attendance today, you can find more details about the work of the program in our annual reports, which are available on our website, nps.gov slash NAGPRA under law and policy. Uh, as you all know, one of my explicit responsibilities as the manager of the National NAGPRA program is serving as the designated federal official to this review committee and providing you administrative support. As you also are aware, um, you held a, a series of six meetings of the NAGPRA Review Committee uh, between June and August in 2021. Um, I wanted to update you on the uh, disposition recommendations that you made uh, during that series of meetings in June uh, to August. If you recall, you heard five different requests for disposition of culturally unidentifiable human remains and made recommendations to the Secretary of the Interior for those. Um, just last week, um, or actually <laughs> it's been a long week, on Monday, um, five notices were published in the Federal Register related to those dispositions. Um, so I will be following up on this meeting and provide the committee with um, both a copy of the notices that were published, um, as well as a copy of the letter that was sent from the Secretary of the Interior um, concurring with your recommendations. Um, in addition, as you're also aware, um, we have worked since the end of your, your last meeting in August to prepare minutes as well as transcripts of those six meetings that were held last in the summer. Um, the transcripts as well as the meeting minutes and the recordings for those uh, six meetings are available again on the NAGPRA program website. Uh, prior to this meeting, the review committee did convene one subcommittee meeting as well as had an administrative meeting to prepare. Um, and as you are all aware, we will be discussing um, the subcommittee work, especially as it relates to the report to Congress uh, later in this meeting. With that, um, I would be happy to answer any questions that the committee might have about the National NAGPRA program or its work uh, since your last meeting in August. If there are no questions, I want to thank Melanie and uh, also um, the, the uh, National NAGPRA program staff for the support they provide for the review committee, as well as the other uh, um, work that they're they're doing and moving forward uh, with the program. So thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, next on our program, we have a presentation from the Pueblo Grande Museum. Melanie, do you want to do the introductions or uh, any background we have on the presentation or the presenters? Um, certainly, I, uh, I will leave the um, introductions to the presenters themselves, but I, I will tell you that we do have, a, after this presentation from the Pueblo Grande Museum, we have two additional presentation requests, and, and I will introduce those um, after, after we hear from uh, Lindsay Vogel-Teeter um, at the Pueblo Grande Museum. Lindsay? Hi, thank you. Give us just a second to get our PowerPoint up here. Can you see us? Yes, we can see you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, NAGPRA Review Committee members and 
Madam DFO Melanie O'Brien. My name is Raylan Williams. I am the cultural resource specialist with the Hill River Indian Community Tribal Historic Preservation Office. My colleagues and I are presenting today from the Pueblo Grande Museum, a Hulgum traditional cultural place to the Akamil Atham, Akamil Atham and the Thon Atham of the four Southern tribes of Arizona. We will individually introduce ourselves as we go through our presentation. We are here to present an example of a NAGPRA consultation involving the Pueblo Grande Museum, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, the Hill River Indian Community, and the Wool Rock Museum. We are a state entity, a federal agency, and a tribe working with a private museum on an issue concerning the unauthorized dispersing of cultural items from collections that are either from the museum and the federal agency to the private museum. Archival research led Pueblo Grande Museum to the Willow Rock Museum and Wildlife Preserve where NAGPRA and non-NAGPRA cultural items were sent without proper authorization to the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the city of Phoenix. The Willow Rock Museum and Wildlife Preserve located in Northeastern Oklahoma was established in 1925 by Frank Phillips. The Frank Phillips Foundation Incorporated was founded by the late Frank and June Phillips is a 501c3 governed by a board of trustees. The foundation oversees the operations and the preservation of Willow Rock Museum and Wildlife Preserve. They're not subject to NAGPRA because they are a private museum with private funding and have no history of receiving any federal funds. The Board of Trustees will have to make the final determination to return the cultural items. Through NAGPRA consultation, Pueblo Grande Museum currently holds collections from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, identified five cultural items culturally affiliated with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and the Hill River Indian community that were sent to the Wool Rock Museum. These cultural items were recovered from our ancestral Hulgum sites, which present, which present day archaeologists refer to them as Hulgum archaeological sites. These Hulgum sites were identified to be within the reservation boundaries of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and the Hill River Indian community, as well as the Phoenix metropolitan area. This presentation will review the steps that were taken by Pueblo Grande Museum and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and how bringing this situation we are in to your attention. The next, uh, Lindsay will do the next slide. Hello, my name is Lindsay Vogel Teeter. I'm the curator of collections for Pueblo Grande Museum, and I'm a City of Phoenix employee. Uh, first of all, I want to give you an overview of how the objects got to the Wool Rock Museum. Then I'm going to give you a brief overview of the objects, and finally discuss the city's actions. First of all, I wanted to introduce the site of Pueblo Grande and the museum. The museum itself is located on a Hulgum site in Phoenix, Arizona. The photograph on the screen shows the prehistoric platform mound here at the site of Pueblo Grande. It goes by the same name. The site has been owned by the city of Phoenix since 1924. In 1929, the city hired Odd Halseth to be the first archaeologist in the nation that worked for a municipal government. He worked for the city until 1960. Mr. Halseth was responsible for intensive excavations at the site of Pueblo Grande, along with excavations at other sites throughout the Phoenix Valley. 
And we also built the first museum on top of the prehistoric site. In the 1930s is when Mr. Halseth uh, did these excavations and constructed the museum. At the same time, Mr. Halseth had developed a relationship with Frank Phillips, who founded the Wool Rock Museum. In our archives, we have dozens of letters between the two of them, so we have a good idea about what they were discussing. And the bulk of their discussions revolve around Mr. Halseth seeking a job at the Wool Rock Museum. To make a very long story short, short as part of his job seeking, in October of 1940, Mr. Halseth sent 99 objects from Pueblo Grande Museum to the Wooler Rock Museum. We know this because we have the inventory as well as the shipping receipts. The bulk of these objects were archeological and from the Hulagum cultures. 71 objects were from the city of Phoenix land and almost all of those are from this site of Pueblo Grande. Five objects were obtained from Gila River lands and Salt River lands, and three objects were from a personal collection of a city employee, the Kelly Collection. The museum does not have ownership of those three objects. However, we believe that the remainder of the 99 objects either fall into the ownership of the city of Phoenix or the BIA. Within the 99 objects that were sent are 39 funerary objects. Those objects were identified in consultation with the Gila River Indian community and the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. They were identified based upon archeological field notes, archival photographs, and museum catalog cards that clearly demonstrate that those objects were removed from graves. We also believe that human remains were sent to the Woolrock Museum. We based that uh, on some, the contents of some letters between Mr. Halsett and Mr. Phillips that, discuss, that discusses the insides and the, the contents of some of these funerary vessels. And there are also objects on the inventory that are sacred to Gila River and to Salt River, and previous objects like those have been repatriated to them under NAGPRA. The important argument from the city of Phoenix and from the BIA is that Mr. Halseth did not have legal authority to make this transaction. There is a state of Arizona law about municipalities giving gifts. And there's also a city of Phoenix code that states that only the city council is able to divest of city property. The two quotes on the screen are quotes from correspondence between Mr. Phillips and Mr. Halsey. The top one is from Mr. Phillips and it asks, who should I thank at the city for this gift? And Mr. Halsey replies, you don't need to thank the city. It's clear evidence that no one knew what he was doing and he didn't have the permission to do this. This was part of his argument and his attempt to get a job from Mr. Phillips. The museum first learned about the objects at the Woolrock Museum in the 1990s when one of our contract employees had visited the Woolrock Museum and noticed who gum objects. They also noticed that the catalog numbers on the objects were similar to the objects or similar to the numbers used at Pueblo Grande Museum. The picture on the screen is a catalog card from the 1930s. At the upper left is a number, it's unique. And that number and sequence was used on the objects here at Pueblo Grande and is used on the objects that were sent to the Woolwalk Museum. We have catalog cards in our collection that match the inventory of objects that were sent to the Woolwalk Museum. So we believe they're there. The NACRA objects were identified during consultation in 2018. These consultations were funded by a NACRA grant. Based on our consultations, our museum sent a letter to the Wawak Museum stating that Mr. Halseth did not have the legal authority to send these objects and also requesting the return of the 39 funerary objects for repatriation under NACRA. The reply we received stated that the Wool Rock Museum did have uh, the legal right to obtain these objects and that they were not subject to NAGPRA. Later, we did receive an uh, open records request from a law firm uh, on retainer to the uh, Wool Rock Museum. We sent all records, so multiple gigabytes of data, um, demonstrating our ownership of these objects. Um, since then, we've had very sparse communication with the Woolrock Museum, and we've been unable to come to a resolution. 
At the same time all this was happening, our museum was in the process of submitting our NAGPRA notices. When our notices were submitted to National NAGPRA, they noticed that some of the items in our notices are actually in the custody of the BIA. We've been working with the BIA since 2020 to ensure that both of our NAGPRA responsibilities are fulfilled. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Gary Cantley, archaeologist with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I've been in this position since about 1994. And uh, I want to start out by first thanking and complimenting uh, Lindsay uh, Vogel Peter and the Pueblo Grande staff about the great work they did that should be readily apparent for that last little presentation she gave, the impressive amount of work that's involved in that and archival, I mean, dealing with the objects or you know, material that's dating perhaps over 80 years ago. And so a crucial thing in there was that they found an Antiquities Act permit relating to excavation by Mr. Helsat and on the Gila River and Salt River Indian reservations. Now, BIA, we from the very beginning have always uh, read that the Antiquities Act, when it was prevailing authority, uh, says that those objects you know, excavated under Antiquities Act permit belong to the federal government. That puts us on the hook, the BIA in this instance, for our responsibilities for NAGPRA. And that's our intent, of course, is to satisfy that. We have communicated a few times with the Little Rock Museum. We have responded to her for a request. And in each time, our prevailing uh, uh, response has been that we will do whatever we can to make it easy for the return of those, those objects, even though there's very few of them that came from Indian land. We figure, well, once our representatives get up there to the Willow Rock for the uh, uh, transferring these back, we would be very happy to accommodate working with the Pueblo Grande Museum at the same time. Uh, let me finish by saying that I get great comfort by knowing all the individuals who make up the expert, the august body of the National Review Committee. And it's very good to see a representation there and that we look forward to uh, great success on y'all's behalf. Let me turn it over now to our final speaker. I am Angela Garcia Lewis. I am the Cultural Preservation Compliance Supervisor for the Salt River King of America Indian Community. The people of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and the Gila River Indian community and the other four southern tribes of Arizona have deep and binding ties to one another and believe that the health and continued existence of our communities relies on those bounds. We hold the belief that people are more than physical beings. And people do not cease to exist or to have ties to the earth at the time of death, but go on to a new form of existence only if their physical remains from this world are allowed to continue the natural progression undisturbed. We also believe that objects placed intentionally with the burial must be kept with the remains. Tribal members place offerings with the deceased relative as a religious practice that is a vital part of religion and cultural rituals performed at the death on behalf of this deceased and for the living community. There's universal agreement that these items are the property of the deceased and no one should deprive the dead of his or her tributes from the living, which, also, which is also supported by legal precedent that states the living have an obligation to the dead. It's with these beliefs that we bring to your attention this issue with the Little Rock Museum, a private entity. We assert they do not have right of possession and they do not have sufficient legal interest in this case to retain the remains or funerary objects. There's overwhelming evidence of funerary, funerary context, so there's no doubt they should be repatriated. 
These burials were divided through unauthorized alienation by Ad, Ad Halsif when he sent these pieces out without permission of the state. And it also caused a violation of BIA statutory obligations. Finally, it's a violation of Ottoman traditional culture to, dis to disturb and then distribute funerary objects for any reason, much less for display. This is evident in the fact that no Ottoman burials or funerary objects have been excavated with the intention of permanent curation anywhere or exhibition. And that is understood, it's understood that under the state and federal law that they will be repatriated and reinterred. We bring this to you, the review committee, as an example of issues that we, the Octum, face in relation to the NAGPRA law. We've included the repatriation from private museums as a particular issue in our recent comments to the recent revisions of the NAGPRA regs. Cooperation and community are a cornerstone of Octum Himduk. And as such, we want to come to an agreement with the Wool Rock to repatriate as soon as possible and to continue to build relationships that represent the true spirit of the law. Thank you for your attention. So we want to thank you, NAGPRA Review Committee, for listening to our presentation. And we are available for any comments, questions you may have. I'm going to close the presentation and stop sharing. Thank you. And I will, I will note for both the committee as well as those in attendance that a copy of the presentation is available in the meeting materials. I want to thank the, the presenters very much and uh, not just for this presentation, but for the, the time and effort that's gone into um, making this uh, return happen. Um, Thank you very much for that. I wonder if other members of the review committee have any questions or comments they'd like to make. Uh, Frank, it, it looks like Honor has her hand raised. Oh, okay, Honor, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation that you gave uh, pertaining to uh, what's happened over uh, what sounds like several decades of attempting to uh, seek um, a repatriation. I was wondering if someone might be able to comment a bit, given that there had been mentioned comments that were made um, in the past, I believe it was the past um, comments from tribes to um, regarding our regulations, our NAGPRA regulations about um, what you would like to see uh, with regard to private museums, if you were willing to share. Yeah. The question is how we would like to see museums, um, private museums, um, respond to NAGPRA. We actually would like to see um, the criminalization of the possession of funerary objects and funerary ob um, human remains so that, I'm not sure if criminalization is the correct word, but you know, the prohibition of the possession of human remains and funerary objects so that we would have a clear path to repatriation from these museums that don't have any um, federal nexus that we can use to repatriate. It, um, it's unknown at this point how many are out there and how many um, 
funerary objects are out in private collections still being you know traded back and forth and trafficked it's a really disturbing reality that uh, we haven't even really begun to face at this point we only know that these are there because of our partners with the city and the in the agencies so anything that prohibits the the possession would be very very helpful to us and i realized that would require a change in the act in itself or um, in action in a separate law but i i think that's what needs to be done because right now we're um we're totally dependent on goodwill in some cases and I'd like to add um, that when we submitted our comments uh, to National NAGPRA on the regulations, we included private museums and also the question of museums, private museums who have a um, board that helps or assists the museum with funding and fundraising opportunities or those that are named as like friends of. So for example, the Pueblo Grande Museum has a friends of Pueblo Grande who on the museum's behalf will apply for federal grants to help assist with programs for the museum. And I would assume that because they assist the museum in education efforts and uh, collection preservation, that they too would be subject under NAGPRA. And that was a question that we um, included. And also, you know, that many comments have been raised to NACRA review committee in, in questions regarding the split collections of federal uh, agencies. And we know that that is an issue, you know, that the review committee is working on and trying to uh, get the agencies to learn or find out where their collections are. And we also know that the history of museums and institutions prior to the law, that it was a common practice to share collections or give collections as in our example presented today. Thank you very much for your comments, Bill. Frank, I, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say thank you very much for your comments and for the and for the presentations. And my own um, comment on uh, what I've heard is that it's uh, very refreshing to see the tribes and the uh, federal agencies and the museum working together on this. Uh, and and uh, that in fact, at least in terms of the material that was shared with the private museum that was subject to the Antiquities Act, that uh, there was a legal basis for the return of that. In fact, there was no, re there was no legal basis for it ever having uh, left uh, the, the, the museum. So, um, so that's, I think, a demonstration where a range of laws at this, in, in, in current times, can be used to accomplish these kinds of um, collaborations and uh, uh, cooperation that uh, you've demonstrated in your in uh, this particular case. And I hope you're able not only to achieve the um, the return of the uh, remains and the proper treatment of the remains and the artifacts, but also um, make something of it, publicize it in the museum uh, community and in the agency community as. Uh, an example where cooperation and collaboration uh, can have good results. So, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other review committee members want to comment or on that? If, if I could ask you just to pause for one moment, one moment. Um, I think that um, Lindsay, you, you're not able to see us. Is that correct? Our screen has frozen, but we can hear you. So feel free to ask Good. more questions. <laughs> um, thanks, Melanie. So John has a, uh, his hand up and then Tim. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to thank the presenters for uh, the, bringing this information to the, uh, not just the uh, review committee's attention. Uh, this is why a lot of meetings, <clears throat> I certainly want to invite <clears throat> our tribal uh, nations or, or those from our, uh, uh, who, do, who are certainly doing the work that you do, to not just to bring this to the review committee's attention. Um, this certainly brings it to the attention of a wider sort of a wider sort of public, which I think is important. I think that I think some of that follows upon the, the chair's comments from a few from a few minutes ago. And uh, while we certainly may not may not be able or we may be unable to do something directly uh, right now, this certainly gives the review committee I'm, and I'm hoping the uh, uh, the interior uh, uh, things to to uh, to consider. And it was mentioned too about the some of the things that we're considering is the work with split collections. And I think, uh, and some of the comments that you've mentioned, I've worked in museums before, and it's very interesting how pieces and parts of museum, and if you'll pardon the, the expression, have, especially given the, the time that they've been out there, ended up in the places they ended up because of gentlemen's agreements. I think is one way to, it's probably what you were saying, and that's how they have found themselves parsed out uh, over time. And unfortunately it, it becomes, uh, it's not, I'm not gonna. It's not impossible to to track, but as you said, it's sometimes just it's just by, uh, just by an accident that you that you find out you, you find out these things about the 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 collections. And what I certainly hope comes of this is that uh, there's a positive. It sounds hopefully it's moving in that direction. It's, there's a positive outcome uh, to this, and we have to. Sometimes I think by. I don't say by purpose, we, we tend to lend, uh, lean on a lot of the legalities that are involved. But um, I think what can come out of these discussions is that there are positives uh, that can come that can uh, come to this if we if people come to together. We use the word, we kind of throw around the word consultation, but I think if people actually come to work together, um, that it can that we can that you can avoid all of needless avoid all of that that all those needless discussions when it becomes apparent that the that the solution is 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 right there and is right there uh in in front of you i want to certainly i want to commend you again uh on your uh on your your work and and thank you once again for bringing this for, for making this presentation here at the uh the review committee meeting and once again i said I, I think it's important not just for the review committee to hear uh members of the uh the interior but also the greater public to to hear this and hopefully uh you know, we'll make uh, more presentations of, of, about this with the complications with uh, pieces and parts of uh, collections or uh, the ancestors who, who have who have needlessly ended up in have been been separated over time. So once again, I want to want to thank you and commend you for your presentation and 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 good thoughts and good luck when you're when you're continued you, your work in this area. So thank you, I appreciate it. And Tim. Um, I also want to thank you for the excellent presentation, <clears throat> which obviously reflects an incredible amount of work on your part. Uh, I do have a technical question that I'd like to direct at Gary. Um, you mentioned that there was an Antiquities Act permit that was discovered, and I'm interested in that came up in a BIA archive or whether it's that compilation that was done <clears throat> by the archaeological or the archaeology program at the Park Service, or whether it was in NARA? It was the good work of the Pueblo Grande Museum. Excellent. They were going through their archives and their materials under which that arrived. And so that was a crucial thing right there. And uh, that's a question I had early on with this. And Lindsay promptly responded that they've got it and showed me a copy of it promptly. So uh, the again, reiterating the amount of work that they went through to secure all that material right there uh, is very impressive. And we are very happy to see the Antiquities Act permit. I want, just wanted to take use this as an opportunity as well to 
uh, kind of highlight the work that the Park Service had previously done to compile many Antiquities Act permits um, under the, uh, the leadership of our current committee chair, Frank. Thank you, Tim. It is, I was going to say, I did want to also compliment the museum on its uh, curation of the documents. That's terrific. Really, really glad. And I know, I know Larry's, uh, uh, Gary's very happy to have a copy of that permit now as well. And any others you come across, I'm sure. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. If there's aren't any other questions from the committee members, uh, we, we will Actually, move on. I, I, I would just like to, to clarify, um, Lindsay, and, and um, the, the, the status of the collection is, is that some of it has been repatriated through, through the work of the Pueblo Grande, but there's still... Um, none, uh, so none of the 99 objects that went to the Woolworth Museum have been repatriated. Uh, we have not heard from the Woolworth Museum since 2020 been um, unresponsive to mm -hmm. any queries um, until about two weeks ago when they found out we were giving this presentation. Um, and at that point we were reached out to by their law firm. Um, so we had had no success in returning those 99 objects. What we have been able to repatriate were human remains in um, Pueblo Grande Museum's collection um, that are associated with the funeral objects at the Bulwark Museum as well as um, individuals and objects from the BIA that we're, we're working through the NAGPRA process right now. Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify the status of those 99 objects. And um, I guess, Lindsay or, or the tribal representatives, what are there any next steps you have in, in terms of um, what's next for those 99 objects? This was one step, um, our, our hope is to resolve this amicably with the Willow Rock Museum. Um, there are legal options on the table, um, but our hope is to not have to go that route. Um, we're, we're considering all options. So if anyone has um, ideas or contacts, we would be welcome to that. But first and foremost is that we want to have capitalize on this as an opportunity to make new friends in Oklahoma, period. Be our first uh, approach. Well, so progress indeed, but more work to be done. So, we, I'm sure all of us wish you the best of luck with that, and uh, hope that things can go smoothly and quickly, and get the the repatriation and return um, accomplished. Thank, thank you again. Yes, thank you very Adam, much. DFO, do we? You said there yes. were two other presentations as well. We should move on to, I guess. Yes, um, yes, I um, I wanted to note for, for the committee, but uh, also for those in attendance that at this meeting, as well as at the next meeting, there are there is time available for presentations by museums, federal agencies, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations uh, related to repatriation under NAGPRA. Anyone who is interested in making a presentation um, should contact me with your request. I received, in addition to the Pueblo Grande Museum, um, I received two additional requests for presentations. The, the next presentation request came from Ellen Demink and Anne Amati. Ellen and Anne, you should be able to turn on your video. Thank you, Melanie. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Anne Amati and I'm the NAGPRA coordinator at the University of Denver Museum of Anthropology. Ellen, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I am Ellen Demink. I'm a recent graduate of the anthropology program at University of Denver, where I've worked with Anne. I do currently work for the National Park Service, but what we're presenting on today is work that I started with Anne while I was a student. Um, the University of Denver Museum of Anthropology is a teaching museum with approximately 100,000 objects, primarily archaeological, from Colorado and the surrounding area. We work closely with tribal nations to provide intellectual and physical access to the collection with the goal of one day repatriating all of the Native American human remains and NAGPRA cultural items. 
In recent years, we have focused on developing consensus on the disposition of human remains and associated funerary objects with no known cultural affiliation, as well as working towards the repatriation of individuals already published in notices of inventory completion. We always try to include students in the NAGPRA process when appropriate and allowed by our consulting tribes. We are here today to share with you some research we conducted using data on NAGPRA compliance activities collected by the National NAGPRA program. We started this research when Ellen was a graduate student in anthropology at the University of Denver. We hope this information might help answer some of the questions you had at the last review committee meeting about who the ancestors are that are still pending under NAGPRA. This research started because we were interested in looking into why so many ancestors have not been repatriated yet. Specifically, why are there so many human remains considered pending under NAGPRA with no cultural affiliation? Ellen was also interested in doing some quantitative analysis of data. Therefore, we decided to focus on the data collected by the National NAGPRA program and see what kind of questions we could answer. I do wanna take a moment to thank the National NAGPRA program for collecting this data and making it publicly available so that we could work with it. I also wanna thank Ellen for continuing to work on this after she graduated from the university. Ellen has spent a lot of time evaluating the data in different ways and she's gonna share with you some of the results now. Thank you, Anne. Um, give me just one moment while I share my screen. So the image that I'm starting with is a snapshot of how our data, which is where we get all the numbers that you'll see is organized. Um, all of the individuals accounted for in our data were reported to National NAGPRA as having no cultural affiliation. Um, we've been looking at how the individuals still pending in, NAG in the NAGPRA process are similar or different from those who have been resolved either through subsequent cultural affiliation or 1011. To do this, we've been comparing the amount and types of information associated with individuals across the categories of culturally affiliated, disposition under 1011, and still pending. As I mentioned, we wanted to make this presentation to you because of a few questions that came up in previous review committee meetings, which we thought we might be able to help answer particularly regarding the age of cultural, culturally unidentifiable individuals and what information is known about their location of origin. I also thought the latter would be uh, timely to go over in light of the possible revisions to the regulations around geographic affiliation. Uh, so for this presentation, I'll be focusing on what we know about associated age and location information. Uh, before we dive in, though, there are just a few disclaimers I wanted to make about the data. One is that it is not the most up-to-date information available. The data we began with was current as of 2018, and we have not included any changes in status during 2020 or 2021. Secondly, the information available to us is only what institutions have reported to National NAGPRA. So we do not know what information institutions have that goes into more detail than what was reported in their original inventories, nor what actions institutions have taken since submitting this information other than notice publication. But with that said, the information kept by National NAGPRA still provides insight in a number of respects. Um, one other thing about organization, in discussions with NAGPRA practitioners, regional histories have been mentioned repeatedly as intrinsically connected to the ability of the NAGPRA process to be carried out. To reflect, reflect this in each of the following slides, you'll see the data broken down to the regional level. And um, because I work for the National Park Service, the NPS regions are what are most familiar to me and largely what I use to define the regions. For the purposes of this research, Alaska is included in the Pacific West and the national capital is included in the Northeast. The first thing that the data shows us is that only a very small percentage of the individuals listed as CUI have neither corresponding age or location information. 
It's only in the Intermountain region where there are more than 10% of pending individuals that are reported without either of this information. However, this region also has repatriated the highest proportion of these ancestors at 2% compared to the other regions, which have all returned less than 1%. If we were to filter this data out for only individuals with no location information, regardless of any age data, the graphs would not change noticeably. Um, only in one instance, for culturally affiliated remains in the Intermountain region, is there any difference between individuals with uh, no location information, which is about 20%, and individuals with no location and no age, which is about 18%. It seems that if an individual comes from an unknown location, they are also likely to not have age information. The reverse, however, is not the case. A significantly higher number of individuals have an unknown age than come from an unknown location. This could mean that for individuals with that unknown age, disposition under, under 1011 is largely not ruled out. In the Northeast, Intermountain, and Pacific West regions, over half of the individuals who have been returned under 1011 have no age information, which might suggest that institutions have used these regulations as a strategy for tackling the repatriation of ancestors with limited associated information. In fact, 95% of the individuals pending in the NAGPRA process have some degree of location information associated with them. With such a high proportion, we might expect to have more than the 11,823 of the 127,695 individuals represented in this data set to have been returned under 1011. If the addition of acknowledged Abor Aboriginal land is included in the final regulations, a significant number of ancestors who at the very least have come from a known location may have a path home that they didn't have before. You'll also notice in the table that the trend in the Southeast differs somewhat from the rest of the regions. The culturally affiliated remains have a much higher percentage of individuals without a known age than those returned under 1011, as well as a higher percentage than those with any known age. In these charts, we can compare the percentages of individuals with unknown ages, ages over a thousand years and ages under 1,000 years. Surprisingly, across all regions, there are more culturally affiliated individuals with unknown ages than with known ages that are over 1,000 years. Knowing that an individual is of great age seems to pose its own issues. However, among those pending, there's a broad mixture of known and unknown ages. So whatever, whatever this obstacle may be, that alone does not explain the high numbers of ancestors yet to be repatriated. And to come full circle, with a comparatively small number of ex exceptions, the individuals which have not been culturally affiliated are not without descriptive information, be that age, location, or other types, that could help eventually determine cultural affiliation or pinpoint Aboriginal land. And where details are missing for one individual, there are examples of successful repatriation for others with the same amount or type of associated information. This does give me hope that we can get all these ancestors returned home. Thank you. We'd be happy to answer any questions from the review committee at this time. Uh, anyone on the review committee uh, have a question? Tim. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, very uh, provocative and interesting uh, presentation on the data. Um, you mentioned that this was older data from 2017, 18? 2019. 19. So is this the, the old database that's no longer on the web? Is that where you drew this from? Um. I don't believe so. I we were provided the information from Melanie O'Brien. I don't remember at what time, if it was before or after it was removed from the website. Do you, Melanie? 
Um, yeah, certainly. Um, it is from from our new database where we're able to um, easier, uh, more easily um, extract spreadsheets. Um, and uh, as I have mentioned before, although we restrict what information is publicly available, um, we are um, happy to supply um, information and data from our databases to anyone who requests it. Kind of as a follow up to that, and maybe this is for Melanie. Um, <clears throat> in that database, is there a check between what is in the database? And what goes out in the notice? Because I know sometimes the notice will include additional information that was not submitted or not extracted from the original inventory information. Um, well, certainly, as anyone who has um, tried to correct or update an inventory in the last couple of years knows, um, we frequently need to um, uh, adjust the numbers in an inventory based on. Um, the, the information in a notice. Um, so we certainly do that. And um, part of our process in publishing notices is to ensure that we have a full inventory reconciliation so that the information in the inventory database matches exactly to information um, published in notices. I will say in this case, though, um, the data that Ann and Ellen were working with um, were those um, that were not in notices. Um, uh, in terms of estimating the, the age and location. Thanks. Uh, other members have uh, comments or questions? Honor, did you? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Frank. Um, sure. Melanie, I just had a quick question about why that database may have been taken off of um, you know, our public website? Um, sure. Um, so just first of all, the, there is some inventory information available on the public website. It identifies um, the museum or federal agency, as well as um, the geographic state and the geographic county location um, of the human remains, and then the numbers of human remains and the numbers of associated funeral objects. So that is the information about inventories that is publicly available on our website. What we have removed from the public facing version of the website is information related to site locations, collection histories, age and culture, um, and other information that has a great potential to be sensitive. Um, and um, without a, a better way of redacting sensitive information, um, I, my decision was to eliminate those fields from the publicly accessible website. Thank you, Melanie. I um, wonder if it might be an interesting exercise um, in the future and part of consultation efforts generally, um, if the National NAGPRA program engage in consultations directly with tribes pertaining to what specifically to redact and what not to, which may be culturally sensitive. And I guess a follow-up question with that might have to do with the Freedom of Information Act. Um, with regard to FOIA in particular, um, is there any guarantee of what's submitted to the National NAGPRA program um, that it will not be uh, FOIA'd? Thank you for your question. Um, so um, the National NAGPRA program receives this information from museums and federal agencies. Um, I would encourage any museum or federal agency, as well as Indian tribe or Native Hawaiian organization, when it comes to consultation about what is sensitive, that that conversation should happen between uh, those parties, between the museum and the tribe, um, so that that sensitive information is prevented from ever um, coming to the National NAGPRA program. Um, that is the surest way um, to protect sensitive information. Um, there is no requirement under NAGPRA that sensitive information 
uh, be included in an inventory or a summary. So uh, that redaction, I would say, um, should start um, before even an inventory is submitted to my office. Um, the, as you point out, um, information submitted to the National NAGPRA program uh, is a public document um, and therefore um, can be released under FOIA. Uh, there are no exceptions um, necessarily uh, to restrict uh, information that's submitted um, through the requirements for inventories or summaries. Thank you, Melanie, for that overview. I, I don't see um, other hand. Oh, John, you've got a question, John, or a comment. Yes, just a comment. I want to uh, thank the presenters for their uh, the information uh, brought forth. It certainly uh, has uh, left a lot to consider. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, in terms of, um, uh, and certainly wouldn't be expecting in a presentation of this, of this of nature, it seems like a first step, but uh, it certainly gives pause or gives thought to some of the uh, 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 potential disparities that might be out there or certainly that are, if you want to take a deeper dive into that on what those, uh, uh, I think it's stronger than to say what those numbers perhaps might suggest, uh, but what, well, what it, you know, where returns, why returns are happening or why they're not, or what the interpretations are for those, those, uh, uh, those ancestors and the, the, the collections that are associated with the, the ancestors. So I think it, it's certainly, uh, gives a lot to think about in, ter in terms of the, in terms of, of, of progress made and progress that needs to be made and, uh, uh, and addressed. So I thought the information was really compelling. So I want to thank the presenters for that. And once again, not just for bringing it to the, uh, uh, the review committee's attention, but uh, everyone in attendance, our tribal uh, communities, tribal nations, and uh, those uh, from the, uh, from uh, other uh, federal agencies or museums uh, whose, whose uh, collections those, uh, those ancestors might be a part of at this time. So I wanna thank the presenters again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I'd like to get a couple of comments or questions in, in here as well. I was uh, also very impressed with the, with the presentation and um, the information. Uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, maybe um, Ellen would be the best one to answer these. What's your total population, Ellen? Is it the, what, 116,000 cases that uh, we see uh, referred to as uh, culturally unidentifiable? So the total population for this data set is um, also includes ancestors who were originally um, inventoried as culturally unidentifiable, which have since been culturally affiliated or um, were have um, been returned under 1011. The larger data set also includes 1016, but I didn't use uh, those numbers for this presentation. What what was the total? Um, I would have to, let me pull up my, well, you, my Excel. It doesn't sheet. need to be all that precise, but how much more is it? Um, 120,000 with, um, including the culturally affiliated and, um, disposition under 1011, it's 127,000 approximately. 127. Okay, great. And I, I'm trying to remember um, a, one or a couple, maybe of the pie charts that you showed, you had the category pending and the category culturally affiliated, I assume those are ones that were sets of remains that may have already been returned or were in the process of doing that. And then, and then there was the other usually larger group. Um, is, is that, am I correct in understanding what those different categories are or could you just quickly say what they were? Yeah, so the individual pie charts were um, culturally affiliated. So they had been culturally unidentified and were later, later excuse me, later culturally affiliated and pending. So they're still in the NAGPRA process. Um, and then in the individual pie charts, the categories were for age. So those with no known age, 
ages mm -hmm. over a thousand years old or um, under a thousand years old. Okay. So pending, you would assume, I guess, would eventually become culturally affiliated. Is that eventually culturally affiliated or um, returned under 1011, one of those, or 1016, one of the three. Okay. Options. Okay. Yeah, but be would be repatriated or just yes. in South Africa. Okay. Thank you. Um, just uh, Frank, if I could clarify, pending is is a term I use in the data too, and it means pending consultation and notification under NAGPRA. So it is those uh, human remains identified in an inventory that uh, have the potential for um, consultation and notification under 1011 um, or possibly being culturally affiliated and then put in notices. And generally, Melanie, what do you use to put something in that category? What are they, or some set of remains in that category? There's a. Uh, it includes any um, human remains identified in an inventory, but not listed in a notice. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The other question I had for um, Ellen and maybe Anne as well um, is it possible to get a copy of the, the, the analysis and uh, sort of the, all the details of it. It would be fascinating, I think, to read. You you did a very good job presenting and, and sort of setting the context. Um, it'd be nice to be able to pour over it a little bit more as well, if that would be possible. I would love to share our analysis. It is currently um, jotted down in my notebooks, so there isn't particularly anything um, uh, formal, but I am hopefully will hopefully be formalizing this analysis in a more meaningful way, and would have be happy to share it. All right, that would be terrific. I um, think everybody would probably be interested in one way or another. Um, unless there are other questions from our uh, committee, um, uh, well, John, go ahead. Yes, I apologize. My connection dropped out for about a minute or two, and I apologize. This question was answered while I was. Uh, away, uh, unexpectedly away. Uh, uh, it was there was a a statement mentioned about in the process of NAGPRA or, or those. Uh, what do you what, how do you define in the NAGPRA process? What does that what does that mean? I'm not sure if that was already answered or not. So if it was, I apologize. Um, no, that's okay. I I kind of answered that, uh, Ellen. I'm okay, sorry. Yeah, no, ahead. that's okay. Yeah. I'm happy no, happy. no, go, um, go ahead. So, go ahead. So it, uh, it refers to those um, human remains um, that have been identified in an inventory, um, but are still pending either consultation or notification under the regulations. So that's what we mean by pending under the NAGPRA process. Um, any of those human remains um, reported in inventories um, could be um, subject to a request for consultation under 1011, um, and certainly for notification um, prior to repatriation. So that's, it means they're still uh, pending in the regulatory process. Thank, thanks, Melanie. Well, um, let me also thank uh, both of our presenters uh, for the uh, very interesting, interesting uh, set of data and your analysis of it. I agree with some of the other comments that you've heard from members that um, this, this having these numbers and looking at the, the you know the big number that we that we typically see and, and breaking that down a little bit geographically and in terms of the characteristics of, of the remains, I think is something that could help us all in as we look at, for example, um, revisions to the regulations and what's might be most effective and what would be maybe be less effective. In doing that so thank you thank you very much for taking the time to do that and again i hope we can have a chance to look at the at the details as well frank could i just ask one last yes. question of, of ellen um ellen what do you see as the barrier in repatriation of these um human remains <laughs> that's a big question <laughs> um Looking at the data, it seems to be a focus on, because there's so much location information, it would, my first assumption is that 
moving forward under 1011 should be a lot more possible. And it may be that um, the location's information doesn't line up with adjudicated Aboriginal land, um, but it seems that it might be a, a more of a focus on wanting to culturally um, affiliate versus moving forward with the 1011 regulations. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Um, and one last thing, uh, I want to congratulate Ellen on completing her program. And uh, thank you for continuing to work on the on the problem. Uh, <laughs> thank on you. That. And uh, congratulations to Anne. And also, um, I'm envious. You're lucky to have such well-qualified uh, students that you're able to uh, to work with. So I am. Um, luck I with am. Thank well. you. Okay, Melanie, do we have? Yes, we have one last presentation. And I was going is... to suggest uh, if we can do that, and then maybe we take a break, uh, a short break, and uh, come back for the other, uh, the second half, so to speak. Certainly. Um, the uh, other presentation we have uh, today is from Megan Noble um, at the University of California at Davis. Megan? Hello, and I will start sharing my screen if that's possible. Are you able to see that? Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, Chair McManaman, Review Committee, and Madam DFO. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Megan Noble, and I am the University of California Davis NAGPRA Project Manager. I want to thank and acknowledge the Putwin people on whose traditional lands the University of California Davis is situated. The Federal NAGPRA Network recently invited me to present to their group on, to provide a museum repository perspective on working with federal agencies in compliance with NAGPRA and engage in dialogue about this work. Melanie O'Brien invited me to share some of these experiences here with the review committee today. The intent of my remarks is to offer some examples of real case ex experiences, logistical challenges, and successful collaborations. My intent is not to offer commentary on or critique of individual federal agency compliance. For this reason, I will at times not identify the specific agencies, but rather address the issues presented in each of these situations. I will draw broadly on my experience here at UC Davis, as well as my prior experience at the University of Washington's Burke Museum. In many cases, the first step working towards NAGPRA compliance is identifying who has possession of or control as defined by NAGPRA in order to appropriately identify who has responsibility and decision-making authority in the repatriation process for individual sites, accessions, or collections housed in museums and repositories. On face value, this may appear to be a straightforward process. Ideally, repositories or agencies possess clear records indicating the location of sites, excavation permits, land ownership, and control and responsibility for any resulting collections. In these cases, the repository and agency would have curation agreements in place, clearly establishing the roles and responsibilities of the federal agency and repository. Ideally, agreements would have been completed prior to 1993 and 1995 deadlines in order for agencies to appropriately complete their NAGPRA response obligations. In reality, the ideal is often not the case. In many cases, the reality is assumed control, disputed control, control differs by excavation year, or control which is plain unclear and may not be resolvable. Museum records sometimes indicate federal agency partner or landowner. However, it is often far more complex. I have experienced instances where the repository assumes collections are under the control of a federal agency because the agency contracted with the university and funded the original excavation due to one of the agency's own pending projects. In many cases, these agencies have subsequently denied NAGPRA or curation responsibilities for the resulting burials and collections due to the fact that the property was not under the control of the federal government at the time of excavation. In these cases, our campus now assumes responsibility for NAGPRA compliance for sites we previously understood to be under the control of a federal agency. For large-scale federal projects resulting in systematically collected archaeological collections occurring over multiple years and over broad landscapes, untangling the ownership history can be complicated and time-consuming. Repositories do not typically have easy access to federal agency real estate and land ownership maps and documentation to make these determinations ourselves. We rely on federal agency partners to inform us which sites or collections over which they are able to assert their control. While control is researched, negotiated, and determined, 
repatriations are delayed. One notable collaboration is the close partnership developed between UC Davis and the Bureau of Reclamation Mid-Pacific Region. Historically, Bureau of Reclamation and UC Davis contested whether remains and materials fell under the control and responsibility of the university or the agency. The question of control was delaying consultation in NAGPRA implementation process. Reclamation Mid-Pacific Region NAGPRA coordinator Melanie Ryan and I quickly agreed that either Reclamation or UC Davis would be responsible for NAGPRA implementation. In order to not further delay the repatriation process, our respective institutions agreed to approach conducting documentation work and consultation jointly while the control was further resolved. While not ideal, this was one model to ensure that consultations and repatriations could still proceed. I have experienced cases where revelations come late in the NAGPRA process. In this case, the museum assumed human remains and objects in their care were under their control, and only when mapping the site location in GIS did we learn that private individuals could, had originally collected these ancestors and belongings off of federal lands. While the federal agency may be notified immediately, in these cases, consultation and sometimes inventories and notices have already been drafted. I have worked on cases of split collections where the burial site is artificially divided by property line or excavation year. In my personal opinion, split collection repatriations can often benefit from a consistent and coordinated approach where the agency and the museum jointly consult and work through all aspects of the compliance process. Once the issue of control has been resolved, the NAGPRA compliance itself needs to be undertaken. This brings forth a number of logistical challenges we as museums do not necessarily have when preparing and consulting on human remains and material under our own control. Human remains, collections, and associated records are in the care of a museum or repository and often geographically distanced from the agency staff and decision makers. Federal agencies need to rely on museums to provide timely access to these records. I've seen six, multiple successful approaches adopted to complete the necessary work. In some cases, agency complete, agencies complete all the work themselves. In these cases, the museum provides access and can help facilitate the needs of the agency and tribes as requested. The agency prepares any collections for consultations, consults, and prepares inventories and notices. Another model is the agency's contract with the repository to complete the work or a portion of the work. In this case, the agencies provide funding for museum staff to conduct the necessary documentation work, facilitate the consultation process, and draft inventories and notices. In these cases, the agency maintains their decision-making role. One example of this partnership was between the National Park Service, who dedicated appropriate funding to the Burke Museum on a project basis for specific osteological and collections tasks in order to move forward towards repatriation. A third model I've seen used less frequently Less frequently is the agency contracts a third party cultural resources management firm or NAGPRA practitioner. Considerations for which is practical for each situation may vary. From a repository perspective, considerations include what is the repository's capacity to assist? What is the scope of the repatriation? Can consultation on the site be easily incorporated into the university's existing NAGPRA work? What tribes are involved? Does the repository have an existing relationship with the relevant communities that may provide helpful to this process? Are there adjacent sites that the repository is already consulting and working on that may be part of the same reburial or a part of a regional repatriation strategy? I do not believe that there is a one size fits all solution when it comes to federal agency and repository NAGPRA compliance. The circumstances of each situation need to be considered on a case by case basis. Ideally, the agency and the museum adopt a collaborative approach which focuses on the outcome of repatriation. Before closing, I want to briefly address the communication gap and the resulting impact. This information gap can manifest in a number of ways, both of which can stall the repatriation process. Museums do not improperly inform agencies of collections under their control, or agencies do not properly inform tribes and do not report inventories to National NAGPRA. In both of these cases, information is not reaching tribes as needed to further the repatriation process. As a matter of policy, the University of California has adopted two strategies to bring more transparency and help encourage repatriations. Repatriation coordinators on each of our campuses are required to notify federal agencies, at least annually, to prompt and encourage those agency repatriation efforts. In addition, the campus repatriation coordinators will point, post a list of agency collections by county and controlling agency on a UC public facing website. The postings will broadly describe a site in order for tribes to be able to contact the appropriate agency. 
As a matter of practice, our campus will be notifying agencies prior to posting to make sure they are aware, prepared for any resulting requests, and ensure information is accurate. I am hopeful that these small efforts will allow for better information sharing between the university agencies and tribes. In closing, I have been able to be a part of many successful collaborations with federal and state agency partners. I found these collaborations most successful when agencies have the necessary resources to accomplish the work and agencies and repositories do so by adopting clear lines of communication and pragmatic solutions. Thank you and I'd be happy to address any questions. Uh, Megan, thank you very much. Uh, uh, review committee members, some comments or questions for, for uh, Megan? Well, I'll start with one. Oh, I'm sorry, Tim, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to thank Megan for her presentation. It's always good to hear the good things that the university system is doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, let's see, Megan, um, I've got uh, one question. You're this uh, interesting uh, study. I'm wondering if, uh, if you're having moved from Washington down to, uh, to Davis, uh, sort of um, was was kind of a, a a reason for you to maybe undertake this kind of a get a sense of you know what the lay of the land is out there in the, the California area as opposed to up uh, up in the woods in Washington. It, could you give us a little background for uh, for that and and how it helped you or or didn't? What was frustrating about it or not frustrating? Yeah, and, and I think that's an it's an interesting question to sort of reflect upon the different situation, both in Washington State and in California. Um, and I think what I realized is I think sometimes what I took to be an agency approach was not necessarily an agency approach, but was very particular to the individual staff in that state or region. Um, and I think that there were um, both positive and negative examples of that um, on, in both states um, where um, certain agencies, you know, had a very um, collaborative approach about how can we make this work and trying to navigate, you know, of course, uh, in, institutionally, we have rules um, as federal agencies, they have rules, but how to, to sort of successfully nav navigate them and, and brainstorm. Um, and so I saw a lot of models of that and that sort of transcended um, necessarily an agency. I, I wouldn't say that there was any one agency um, that had an outlook and then I had different experiences in both states. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank, um, Megan, thank you very much. It, it is, oh, Melanie. It, yeah, I, I guess I wanted to ask Megan maybe the same question, and, and that is when looking at um, repositories and federal collections, what do you see as, as the barrier to repatriation? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think one of the barriers is the communication is, is not necessarily getting that information to federal agencies in a timely manner. I, so I think that the, the proposed regulations help resolve some of that is ensuring that museums and repositories are appropriately reporting that information. Um, and then I think the other barrier that I see is a resource issue um, for federal agencies don't have the resources to allocate either to travel to go really do the work in the way that it needs to be done or to contract or consult with the repository themselves to do the work. Um, I've had some examples where federal agencies are very committed to seeing the repatriations happen, but they can't fund the work. So then that um, the ask is basically that it falls on the repository or the institution. And it's very difficult for us to prioritize an agency's repatriation work over our own in those cases. Um, so I think resources I've seen be a, a pretty large issue. Um, I also think um, 
sometimes as a repository, we feel a little bit, um, it's this, this sort of triangle of relationships. And um, we have a relationship with the federal agency and we also have a relationship with the tribe. And in some cases, the federal agencies have requested that we don't share information with the tribe on their behalf. Um, and so sometimes it does, it leads to a not very fluid conversation. Um, and so I think as much as we can do to bring that communication gap together um, can help remove some of those barriers. Thank you. Um, I Frank, I, one I think, question. Yeah, John oh. has his hand up. John. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, my, my question uh, is um, that uh, sort of follow up on the chairs and also uh, Melanie's question. Uh, so um, would you would you say, given uh, uh, parts of your presentation, um, that um, that some of these some some agencies, there's a particular uh, maybe I'll go ahead and say a, an attitude or sort of a how one how some of these places an approach to repatriation um, that you, you made a, a pretty strong comment in one of your answers to, to Melanie <laughs> uh, just now. Um, and so again, would you would you categorize as as a particular these particular individualized attitude that some of these places have in sort of their, I guess, their their view on uh, repatriation, because to me, then that, that impacts the consultation process as well, and the types of, perhaps the types of information that, that, that could, that, that needs to get out there. And I, I want to say that the, you want to be, compel someone to get that out there, but I mean, uh, uh, there needs to be, I mean, I, I think what we're striving for, not just to be compelled or meet a baseline to get some information out there, but to continue to, to go on, uh, continue having these online sort of, or, or ongoing sort of uh, relationships that need to be had. Uh, that so is that what is that sort of what you're sort of what you almost say even sort of what you're saying, but is that what you're you're getting at? That sort of these these uh, these 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 different these differing perhaps uh, attitudes towards uh, repatri repatriation or the repatriation process or the inventory process. Could could color these uh, could color or be uh, be a barrier to the repatriation process or a, a barrier to get the, even getting the information out there the inventory is completed. I, we, I have experience at that. We have experienced barriers um, of individual approaches um, by some of the coordinators that we've worked with, and I don't. I want to say that is not the the majority, but that is the minority of our experiences. Um, in one case. Um, I received a letter from an agency saying that they had completed their repatriation process and um, therefore, you know, um, their, their NAGPRA work was done and, and I quickly responded that that was not the case because we know we have ancestors here that have not been reported on notices um, and tribes have not come to for the transfer process. Um, so we have definitely experienced that kind of barrier. Um, and that is a challenging one for us to confront um, when our point of contact is sort of um, abdicating their responsibilities or what we see as their responsibilities. Um, so I think our, our options are somewhat limited um, in terms of what we as a repository can do. Um, I have had experiences where you know, the repatriation coordinator is, is very much interested and feels like their barriers are coming from above. And so in those situations, they've even asked me, we've collaborated and I've written letters jointly to the regional directors of their agency, um, uh, almost at, at their request, um, but they, they felt like they as a staff person weren't listened to and this was a way to escalate the issue um, from an outsider um, to, to make sure that that issue was escalated within the, their own agency. Um, so that is one small way to sort of help further that along. Um, but absolutely that has been the experiences um, some individuals, federal agency um, repatriation coordinators that are very committed and, and figure out a way to make it work, whether they have the resources or not, they figure out the way and they work with us to figure out the way. Um, and then we've also experienced the opposite, unfortunately. Um, Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Shelby, you have a question or, or a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you very much, Megan, uh, for your presentation. You pointed out, I think, um, a lot of issues that museums that um, serve as repositories for collections owned by 
federal agencies. And I, my question is, I'm just kind of curious at UC Davis, what would you say um, is the percentage of your overall collections that are owned by federal agencies? It is actually quite small and becoming smaller as agencies are saying, <laughs> these actually aren't from federal lands or weren't collected from federal lands at the time. So I believe we have um, eight sites that have federal NAGPRA um, inventory partners for inventories. Um, so those are just the inventories. If we look more at summaries, it's a much larger, um, a, a, lar a larger collection. Um, and from several different federal agencies. So we don't have just, we have probably, of those, we probably have six or seven agencies represented. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, Honor, you have, you have a comment or a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Megan, for your presentation. Uh, Widow, I, um, you talked a little bit about some barriers and dispar disparities that you've noticed among agencies, uh, my question goes toward whether you've also experienced any um, problems or uh, problems with the agency's knowledge of NAGPRA and understanding what those processes are. Um, and if you've seen a kind of a difference in, in that knowledge level from region to region. It's a really good question an interesting one to think about. Um, if I could first say, I'll, instead of focusing on the federal agency, maybe as the state agencies, I, that has come up. Um, some state agency partners that have very much acknowledged their own lack of NAGPRA experience or expertise. And in some of those cases, we have been able to collaborate and work together to find a solution. And in that case, the solution was that I would do their NAGPRA um, I would draft the notices, I would facilitate the um, consultation process, they would be a part of that consultation, but they would pay for all aspects of reburial. Um, so so it, it's just sort of those sort of creative solutions that I think we were able to um, work forward through that. Um, regionally, you know, thinking about federal agency knowledge, um, I would say that most of the NAGPRA practitioners at the federal level that I'm working with um, are quite knowledgeable um, about NAGPRA, do have a great deal of knowledge and experience. Um, so I don't think that, just in thinking about it real quickly here, I don't think that that seems to be the barrier, the knowledge. I think it seems to stem more from resources or attitude or bureaucracy. Um, Thank you, Megan, appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Any any other comments or questions? I just have one little detail. Uh, in terms of the federal agencies where um, Megan, where the where UC Davis is serving as the repository, those are, are primarily or maybe exclusively land managing agencies. Is that the case? Or are there some what we might refer to as development agencies that don't actually manage resources? They are all land managing agencies. Or all land management. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're all right then, uh, Megan. Again, thank you very much for the presentation. It's uh, interesting and uh, uh, it's nice to get a sense of a large area and how things are going there and what the what the issues are. So you've identified some important issues that that people do need to be concerned about and try to work around. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Madam DFO, do we want to take a quick break now? We've got two other fairly substantial um, topics to, to deal with. And so yes, maybe certainly. To, um, we can take time. a break a break at this time. Um, I also uh, turned on the chat. So if anybody would like to make public comment, um, you can indicate that in the chat function. Um, and uh, how long of a break would, would you like to take, Mr. Chair? Okay, well, it looks like we are about, what, 13, 13 minutes or 12 minutes before the hour. What if we say we will start up again and expect everybody back in their chairs and with their screens on and uh, by, by the uh, top of the hour? That'd be okay? Yes, that okay. makes it easy Thank to Thank you all very much. Look forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a good break. Everybody at
give everybody a chance to refresh their memories about what the what the text looks like. Um, and uh, and then um, if things look okay, we'll keep moving through it. Let's stop there for a minute or two, give people, give the review committee members a chance to see if there's anything they want to raise here. I'll remind you that this is a document that I think this is draft six or seven as we uh, worked our way through it. So uh, those of us, at least on the subcommittee, um, have had a chance to go over this, but I want the full committee as a committee in the public session to uh, have a chance to affirm what we're what we're saying here. This executive summary has um, some initial introductory information and then lists the recommendations that we wanted to make in in a in a very short format. And then later at the end of the document, the recommendations are uh, dealt with again and more. And there's more background as to why we've made these recommendations in, in that, that later section. Should we go? No, oh, Honor, you have a comment or a question. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Frank, uh, thank you. I wasn't in the last uh, committee meeting, but I was curious about why um, the GAO report recommendation had been taken out. Um, and if someone could maybe comment on that, uh, I know that there had been a request for doing a GAO report on grants and civil penalties um, and, you know, whether this has been uh, thoroughly compliant with NAGPRA um, or not, or if there's some improvements that can be made. I am going to suggest John, maybe John or Shelby talk about that if they wouldn't mind. I believe that we did talk about that at some length at that, at that last subcommittee meeting. Um, I think John and Shelby had the maybe the most relevant comments on that. Uh, hi, Frank, this is, this is John. I don't know if you can see me or can you hear me? Yep, yes, we can, John, thank you. Uh, yeah, the discussion was, I mean, that was the, that we, the, that we had not had uh, a larger discussion about that in a form uh, right now. And uh, whether, and we, in fact, we stopped the discussion, we stopped substantive discussions on that in the, in the, in the committee because we had not brought that up in a in a more public forum like we're, like we're doing uh, now uh, there was a concern that 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 was that was that was a i would say a, a concern that we hadn't discussed it publicly before that at, at that at that subcommittee meeting that was really the first or perhaps where it had made its appearance in a in a draft without us discussing it to to a to a large extent uh in the in the public setting the other being that, and we certainly didn't discount that the 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 worth that the the a GAO uh, report or GAO research into this uh, uh, might uh, bring certainly bring some things to light. But also, we're so far along in this year's report; it's not something that we had explored or made you know or made really public suggestion about in the in the previous years. And we're actually in the final stages of of putting this. Of putting this forward in this report, other than to say that we would make a recommendation that the GAO look into this, but beyond that, we we hadn't we haven't had we haven't had we get to have a you know really substantive discussion about that in the public forum um, about that particular topic, and that might be something that would be moved to the to the, the to the committee's review committee's business for next year to actually have more weight in that report or something that the review committee review committee had worked on. Uh, in the in the upcoming year, since we hadn't since we hadn't done since we hadn't worked on that or discussed that uh, within the the within the sort of the the, con, uh, the confines of, the, of this of this year's uh, report of the time or the time frame, but it was it was new at that point. And any other members wish to comment on that aspect? Honor, do you have a? Uh, for further thought on it, you did. 
Yeah, uh, John, thanks for that explanation. Um, I would maybe suggest that this be put, um, that we start talking about this in our next review committee meeting um, and put it on the agenda and continue to talk about it um, throughout the next uh, year at least as well. Um, I think there, I, I'm, I think some of those recommendations uh, had early on been made uh, due to comments uh, consistently uh, coming to the fore about civil penalties um, <clears throat> and some uh, disagreement about whether those are actually being enforced. So mm -hmm. I think that's how the GAO uh, investigation came to the forefront. Um, I don't know if any other committee members may like to add to that at this point, um, but I do think it's important that we look into this. Thank you. Yeah, Hi, this, uh, is, this, is, this is John again, sorry. And I, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, we didn't, we certainly weren't uh, saying that it wasn't, that it wasn't important, it, that it just, that this, at this time it fell outside of, you know, the the work of the work of this year and and certainly what those numbers or the, the suggestions that were have been put forth by other review committee members uh you know that it was uh like i said we hadn't done that work uh or that hadn't been that hadn't been had, hadn't been discussed uh, you know uh i guess fully or put forth to the public or uh and I, as just to just sort of follow up again on that just to say that we hadn't we hadn't covered that in this year's work and so i i think we all we probably agreed that, that that's cer certainly something to be revisited in the uh in the new year and for uh probably next year's in next year's report for the work of the review committee as well okay thank you honors that that's satisfactory we'll um we'll put that on as a topic for a discussion maybe at, um, as new business, not, I think probably not this meeting, but in a future meeting, either on the 23rd or subsequently, we, we talked about having additional meetings in the new year. Yeah, I, I think it would be good to begin on the 23rd. Um, something that I was also very curious to view um, that I think would be helpful in maybe making a recommendation in the future based on what we hear is also seeing the comments um, that have come in from the tribes, um, in particular uh, with regard to the NAGPRA regulations uh, presently, uh, but also, you know, any future recommendations having to do uh, with uh, revisions or amendments to NAGPRA or other legislation. Um, I think these GAO reports are informative um, to help move um, to help move some of the issues brought forward by tribes um, and museums and federal agencies. Okay. Okay. Well, let's plan to uh, let's plan to do that. Um, we can maybe we can set set some time aside for the twenty third to at least begin those discussions and identify maybe identify some not just to have a, a GAO report but to and again this is something we can't recommend or the department can't recommend because it's a, a, I think congressional members have to ask GAO to do a, a report but maybe we identify some subjects uh, that we would we would ask again we could ask congress to uh um, um have gio look into some specific examples just as you as you suggested if that's okay um and there aren't are there any other comments on the executive summary okay if, if not, let's go ahead and scroll down. Madam DFO. There we go, thank you. And um, Melanie, why don't you express your comment here? Um, certainly. So uh, in, um, this summary of activities, um, the, the statement 
about positive relationships, um, foster mutually beneficial public interpretation of America's earliest human cultures and enhances broad support for the contemporary care and stewardship of cultural items associated with them. Um, I wanted to encourage the full committee to have a discussion, particularly about this um, piece on America's earliest human cultures and ensure that everybody um, thought that this was um, the, the right language to be using here. John, I'm sorry, you have your hand up. John, I think you're- right, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank um, you. Um, yes, Melanie, thank you for uh, pointing that, certainly bring that to the review committee's attention. Uh, Deb had seen that earlier. Um, and I guess, um, I guess I'm somewhat uncertain about, I'll say uncertain about, but the sort of the, the languaging uh, of that, I think I perhaps get where that's, where that's going, uh, but um, a few points I have, one about the uh, being mutually beneficial, not who that's, who that's between the parties or peoples, and also the, the, I guess probably where it's been highlighted too, where I see it on my copy, about America's earliest human cultures. Um, certainly if we're gonna be more in line with the, the NAGPRA legislation or I guess the things that we're looking at, I'm not sure we call it America's earliest human cultures. I tend to lean more towards cultures, but also the, the saying, using the words people, the peoples that make up those cultures. And also since we're saying earliest, it's probably, it, Perhaps even more accurate. I shouldn't even say perhaps. It's or it's even more accurate to say that it's the the, the first. Uh, how you want how we want to approach when we, when we think about the the languaging of that, because it in some ways sends a message. And I think that one whether it's in line with not just the the NAGPRA uh, law, also the regulations, but also the work of the review committee and the and the reasoning behind and why that the the law was passed in the first place and who that recognizes. Uh, Frank? Yeah, so Honor, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Um, I'm in agreement with John, um, <clears throat> maybe uh, referencing Native Nations um, or First Nations might be a good idea here, um, as opposed to America's earliest human cultures. Um, but I generally agree with John. Thanks. If we if we um, made the change to saying first human cultures, or if we which what's the preference that or first um, nations, first American nations, or something like that, John, you have your hand up. Or is that from the first your first comment? Maybe? Yeah, that was from my first comment. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. This, I think, the actually, I think the earlier draft of this was uh, it, it was did say first uh, America's first uh, human cultures. But. I guess some, um, you know, part of what I wanted to highlight here was was both the the phrase America's earliest human cultures, but but also that the relationships foster mutually beneficial public interpretation, um, and then um, support contemporary care and stewardship. I know that um, many tribal representatives that I speak to um, do not see NAGPRA's goal um, as uh, either public interpretation or care and stewardship. Um, and, and that's, I guess, part of the concern here is, as well as the phrase America's earliest human cultures. Uh, this is honor. Uh, Melanie, I. I'd agree with that second, just looking at the second part of the sentence as well. Um, I think it's, um, I think we need to discuss this more. 
I, I tend not to like the word stewardship either. That's my personal preference. I, I would just say that the in, initial intent here was uh, to show how some of the positive relationships um, between museums and tribes or agency and tribes, like we heard um, the presentation from um, the Pueblo Grande and Salt River Maricopa uh, um, tribe and, uh, and the BIA, that those rela positive relationships that have been fostered by compliance with, with NAGPRA attempts to, attempts to uh, rectify bad situations. The idea was that uh, this was building a, um, a you know, commonly and mutually supportive relationship and in the long run would um, be a better thing for, for example, graves protection or future repatriations and things like that. That was the intent. So if it's not getting, if it's not coming across that way, we should, we should modify it. Or we could just, not not say something like that, and not try to say something like that. Uh, it it kind of sounds a little bit uh, repetitive of of what you, but in the sentence just before it. So I I might suggest that we just strike this sentence entirely. Shelby, you have a comment. Yes, um, I I would agree with Melanie. I think we should strike this sentence. Um, it it um, I mean the intent of of the act is repatriation, and I think that having something in about stewardship of the collections and it's kind of assuming there would be ongoing care on the part of museums to to take care of these. Uh, NAGPRA related human remains and, and cultural items, which is kind of in op opposition, I think, to the intent of the law and that the law is to, the focus is to repatriate. So I would, I would recommend we strike this sentence. Uh, we do, as, and as, as Melanie pointed out, we do talk about the positive collaborations and cooperation in the sentence just above that. Well, that that's uh, fine with me, and I and I appreciate those those concerns. Actually, it's not intended to even refer to collections, but I could see where that's the way someone would, would read it. But that that just that these cultural items are cared for, they might be cared for in a in a collection in a in a tribal collection, or they might be cared for by um, a, a, a tribal clan or a polity that. You know, utilizes them actively in, in, in other ways. So um, that was that was the the intention. But if it's not coming across that way, we should get it out of there. So uh, um, if everybody's thinks that's a good idea, or a majority think it's a good idea, well, let's go ahead and do that. Right, this is Barnaby. Yes, I agree as well that we should go ahead and take that out. Anyone object? Okay, other parts of that section are pretty just factual lists. Then uh, we have summaries of the meetings. Melanie, you have another comment here on this on this section, I guess, really. Yes, um, my comment is for the committee to discuss the value of the individual meeting summaries. Um, we, um, the, the um, in preparing a finalized version, Frank and Shelby um, had a disagreement over the value of these, and so uh, we are bringing it to the full committee to discuss the value of these individual meeting summaries. Um, if they are to be retained, um, one suggestion was that we should add even more information 
um, to them to reflect who made comments um, and perhaps even um, summarize the statements. So just to say what, what I was suggesting, uh, the reason for including them um, was that it would give uh, readers or people who were um, looking at the, at the report, whether they were congressional staffers or, or um, interested members of the public or researchers, future researchers who wanted to try to identify what the committee did in different at different meetings, this would be a little bit of a of more detail, uh, and then they could go to the transcript, which I think would be the next level of detail that, that they would have any ability to, to get to, uh, and look at that for the for the for what they were looking looking for. Otherwise, it's um, if you were looking, for example, to uh, find out very specifically what the um, the case that we heard from the Tennessee Valley Authority or Fort Lewis College or Michigan State University, it might be actually difficult to, to find that if you only had to, the transcripts to go by, you'd have to look through uh, those or do some sort of a search on individual transcripts to find out which, was, which one was the right one. Tim, you've got a comment. Um, <clears throat> I, know I don't. I didn't participate in the discussion of this. Um, of to collapse them into one kind of characterization of numerous meetings, or of expanding these. I see the value in having <laughs> each individual meeting listed. I don't think we want to spend additional time to add additional information about each one. So I guess I'm, I think I'm okay with these, this description as it stands. <clears throat> Any other comments? Shelby, did you want to? Say anything about our review of this? No, I'd I'd prefer to just hear from other members of the uh, of the committee. Thank you. Right, Mrs. Barnaby, I agree. You should uh, just leave it as it is, <clears throat> and there's no need for identifying people's comments, individual members' comments. It just takes uh, more time to read and the summary, that's what it's for. <clears throat> if you wanted more detail, then they can always go to the websites for the transcripts. I, I think the, the additional detail we talked about when we um, met as a, actually it was just a portion of the subcommittee, we met with uh, Melanie and Lisa about it. The only additional detail I think was where, um, where there was, uh, if there was a presentation given in some of the meeting summaries, we only said a presentation was given and in others we had identified who, who the presentation was from. And so we said, well, if we're gonna have that level of detail of saying who, the, who did the presentation in one, in one meeting summary, we should do it for all of them. So that would, not be a substantial amount of additional information, but it would be a little bit more detail, kind of similar to the, you know, the level of detail of saying which um, disposition uh, requests we had uh, heard information about. So it wasn't a lot of additional detail. I, th I think that was my, my recollection, I think, in the, in the discussion. John. Yes, uh, and so then what you're suggesting then is, it, although we're not going into full detail, but like we see here, like bulleted out, just very short. Here's who here's who gave a 
presentation during that yes. during that particular meeting. Right. Right. Is that what you're had had been proposing? That yeah, and that was that my might, understanding of where we came out on that. We and then that and the and, and that, that might find if one wanted to then click on a link to see further detail and at least in the in the report, they would know that that was the that, that was where they needed to go rather than trying to do a deep dive on a transcript if they could just see it oh okay that's the the, the at the 68th meeting or 66 meeting this is what they talked about or that this is who spoke and then know where to go uh but nothing beyond like an extra bullet point or something like that just to say who spoke and give the presentation correct yes uh shelby Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think when we were when we were discussing this, this was um, my thought as well. Was just when it says um, you know benefited from uh, uh, or somebody gave a public presentation was just who gave the presentation and what organization or museum or institution they were representing. It's not adding a lot more. It was just kind of just so if somebody were looking at this and we go, oh, I'd like to know more about that particular institution and the work they're doing or something like that. They could look it up in the transcripts or the minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me just remind everyone that we do have minutes. So um, the minutes are a, a good way of finding out who presented um, and on what topic in a short summary. Um, and, and again, um, the question is, I would say, more for for members of Congress and and this level of detail in your report. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Honor, you have a comment. Uh, hi, thanks, Melanie. Uh, thanks, Frank. I, uh, I I think I'm in agreement that it would be worthwhile to just have a little bit more detail there. Uh, I don't think that harms or lengthens the report to too much um and i think it's it's worthwhile there thank you for putting that in up at the top having the minutes and transcripts of past meetings link uh for further detail but i think those identifiers are important in a report thanks Anna. i think what i hear in answer to this question is um that we'll include these listings in our report to Congress, as well as having some information like this in the minutes, uh, but we'll add a little bit more detail just in terms of who did presentations. Is that, Honor, do you, you have another comment? That sounds good to me. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Okay. Just so I can confirm, um, the National NAGPRA program will add um, the name of the person, of each person who made a presentation or gave public comment to this list. And, and I think and the organization when that's when it's a, uh, a you know, presentation, like the three presentations we heard today. Oh, Tim, I'm sorry, you got your hand raised. Sorry. Yeah, I, think, and I think in terms of a congressional audience, the, the congressman or their staff is probably gonna be more focused on the organizations than they are the names of the individuals. They're gonna to wanna to know if, if um, a university or a tribe in their state or in their district talk to the committee. And I don't think it's gonna be as important on who the individual was. So to the extent we can summarize that as the organizations and not list each of the presenters, that'll shorten it and will provide some information that I think the Congress people might have find useful. Okay, 
that sound reasonable to everybody? Or anybody object to doing it that way? John? Uh, then my, then my question is, so are the are we just limited to the uh, the organizations, uh, meaning the like federal agencies, and then naming the the, the tribal organizations or, or or tribal nations, and then not or even if we get down to the the I think Melanie mentioned something about like the public comment. Are we then are we not listing the the end of, like those individuals or those persons named individually? Are we at least listing where they uh, come from? Um, I, uh, John, my recollection in, in our discussion with, in terms of the public comments was that I, I don't know that we were talking about um, listing what individuals actually made public comment. Okay. It was, it was mainly the presentations. And on the presentation side? That was my recollection, but uh, Shelby, is that yours as well? Um, yes, that was my recollection as well, was just uh, focusing primarily on the present uh, official presentations. Okay. So that will that will make it a little shorter. Okay, that um, that gives me the direction I need to add only to the presentations. As I have done here, I might have gotten the order wrong, so I'll have to check. Uh, the minutes, but um, basically it's just those two. I think if we went back and did a quick check on the agendas for those meetings, we. Yes, I, I will check it. I just I can't. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Right here. Right well, we're now. all here. <laughs> okay. so, but those are the only two presentations here. So um, otherwise, this will stay the same. Okay. So then we have two other sections. One is on progress made, and we've uh, identified some organizations there. And then on barriers to overcome. Uh, Melanie had a comment here. Yeah, so my comment here is uh, for the committee to discuss uh, if they feel um, that it it is uh, necessary under NAGPRA um, to um, implement on a case by case basis. My reference here was the broader approach that you heard from the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, um, where they have not taken a narrow case by case uh, approach. Um, but rather a, a broader cultural affiliation approach. John, you have a comment. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, that was my hand. I had my hand okay. raised in an earlier comment. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. I, I missed it earlier. Um, I, I, I guess in response to, to Melanie, my reading of case by case approach isn't, wasn't that it was a, um, single set of individuals by single set of individuals approach, but a more, like we, a case would, in, in my, my reading or my understanding of what we meant there was a case would be, for example, um, the case we heard from the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was, you know, I forget the exact number, but a substantial number of human remains and funerary objects that, uh, um, or one one particular case. We didn't do we didn't do it, you know, one set of remains by one set of remains. But uh, so it wasn't that that kind of a of a use of the of the phrase case by case. I just wanted to highlight this for the committee's um, consideration, both the the necessity of case by case, but also. The committee's expression that of the complexity of NAGPRA. Well, we could. Uh, would you suggest you, your solution to your concern would be by dropping 
the of necessity phrase? I, I just wanted the committee to consider it. Um, this is not a sentence that I would, uh, I, this is not how I would state um, implementation of, of NAGPRA. I, um, I find that a lot of times what, what I have to do is explain to museums that it's not so complicated, that it doesn't have to take a long time, and that there, because that is the way that so many institutions have approached this, it can often seem that way. Um, but in reality, NAGPRA can be um, much simpler um, to implement and to get to repatriation. Comments on that from the committee members? If if this is okay with the committee and it's only my concern, then you don't need to consider it because this is your report. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Uh, Melanie, uh, thanks for your comments. And Frank, you know, maybe part of this is balancing out um, this section with some of the difficulties that tribes have brought forward in having repatriation processes take decades uh, when that did not necessarily have to be the case. Mm. Um, and thanks, Melanie, for your, your comments. Thank you, Anna. I think maybe one thing that um, this reflects, I'm just looking at the, the, uh, the bolded uh, initial sentence, uh, more complicated than originally envisioned. I, I, think, I think that's actually has been the case, or it's, maybe it's become the case. Um, some of the earlier uh, repatriations that occurred that I'm familiar with uh, were pretty straightforward, but as we got into dealing with some of the issues that have come up about making determinations of cultural affiliation, um, it it has become more more complicated, and um, so I think the overall thought of, you know, why is it taking so long is, um, is captured in, in the, in, in part, at least in the, in that, in that bolded uh, sentence. And then the, you know, the rest of the paragraph sort of follows, follows from there. So it does seem to me that that is one of the barriers that we've, we've encountered. Um, some of the, maybe some of the uh, modifications that we see in the Department of Interior draft changes to the regulations is uh, an attempt to get, get around some of that, that complexity. We'll, we'll have to see how that plays out, whether that raises additional concerns or other concerns. But in terms of, Current situation and our perspective on it, I think uh, I, I'm not wedded to the term of necessity. I'm, I'm not actually sure where this particular chunk of text came from, but uh, I, I think it, you know a key component of, this, of the complexity is the, the way it's it's being handled. That it may be that may be the way we want to handle it. May, maybe not. Maybe not. I'm not saying it is or it isn't at this point. It's, yeah, I think it will be discussed in more detail as we deal with uh, the proposed regulations, but um, I'd say that's maybe that's my perspective on it. But. Other comments from members? I, I, oh, I'm sorry, John, go ahead. I, yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not altogether with that with that particular 
with that particular uh, statement. Um, and then the, the sort of the, or even to what degree that the, the rest of the statements that or the rest of the, the paragraph that follows that, I'm not even sure how that, that supports that, that how that supports or how strongly that supports that, 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 that statement. Um, um, or if the sentence is even, is even, is even uh, needed. The, the sentence that begins a key, a key component? Yes, yes. That's right. Do you have do you have a suggestion, John? Do you want to make a suggestion that we remove it or that you revise yeah, it? Yeah, my, my suggestion would be to would be to remove would be to remove that. Okay, I, we have two other comments. Let me, let me see. Honor, your your hand is up, and then Shelby also. Yeah, you know, um, John. Thanks for your comments too. Um, I was I was wondering if this might be a good place to also put in. Uh, that these line items for NAGPRA don't exist um, necessarily in federal agency budgets and have that be part of that recommendation. Um, and the other is uh, from things we've heard from tribes over the past few years um, and this past year as well, that uh, perhaps institutions are not um, investing enough in their repatriation departments, um, and that this is also contributing to um, the number of years that it's taking for NAGPRA compliance. Thank you, thank you, Honor. Shelby, do you have a, did you comment, want to comment on this as well? Thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, in looking at this again, I, I tend to agree with John because I think that sentence almost feels like it's stuck in there because then the next sentence goes back to the GAO report. So I'm, I'm wondering if we strike that sentence as well as a related factor at the beginning of the next sentence and just leave it highlighted nearly 10, 10 years ago by the GAO is that the vast number of human remains and cultural items under the legal control of federal agencies are curated by non-federal agencies because we talk a little bit more about that mm -hmm. in this particular paragraph. It just seems like this almost seems like it's a little out of place um, in terms of the GAO, because we start talking about the GAO report. I didn't catch that before, but now when I'm looking at it again. Mm -hmm. Uh, how does that sound, uh, John? Go ahead. Yes, and then to to follow on on that, not to backtrack too much, uh, but uh, even the 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 title or the heading of this this particular point, because um, I, I think what we're we're almost asking question. We're, if we're almost asking a question or putting this forward. Uh, we, we, while we're saying it says NAG for compliance is much more complicated than, than originally in, envisioned, uh, for me anyway, uh, I guess the question I have is why has NAG for uh, compliance? Why or how has it become much more complicated than, than originally envisioned? Mm -hmm. Is that a question we, is that a question we have? I mean, I think that's a question we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Well, I mean, maybe that's something we want to um, look look into. Hmm. Because it, it, I'm sorry, it seems uh, it uh, it seem it seems to me that when we say that now we're uh, with this particular uh, point, while I certainly see that we're, we want, we're trying to strike a balance, we're also, in some ways, you know, we're not. I mean, uh, we want to bring this uh, 
to light in support of these these places that are trying to that are trying to 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 meet these requirements, but we also don't want to provide an out either. Is is um, a continued out for not meeting compliance either, for not being in compliance. Oh, I I yes, I certainly agree. We don't we don't want to. I mean, we're not saying uh, oh, it's complicated, so don't worry about it or it's complicated so we understand why you haven't done it. I don't think we're saying that at all. I think, I, I don't, I know in some of it to, you know, look at or, or listen to some of the things that I hear from people in museums who are working on uh, consultation and um, complying with, with the statute. And I think in, I think in good faith and, you know, spending money, uh, their, you know, their own, uh, institutional funds to uh, accomplish this that uh, um, you know that sometimes it is complicated maybe not not in every every last case but there's a lot of things to uh, to look at so um, we this is in the section barriers encountered in the past I think in fact I think this particular section or some sense of this section came from uh, the the um, what the 2018-2019 uh, report? I believe I'm not certain of that. So this isn't this isn't a new idea that we're just coming up with it at this point ourselves. It's something that's been um, among the, the recommendations, I believe, in past reports also. But we can certainly modify it, or if uh, if this isn't a, a part of the problem, then we should, we should say that. But I think, I think it, I think there's some validity to it as a, a barrier. Now there are, uh, you know, ways of getting around that barrier. What, what might they be? In some, in, in, in some, uh, one of, one of the ways around it is providing more funding to get, to get the job done. We've, we just mentioned that just in this conversation we're having about the report, more, more funding for tribal programs, more funding for federal agencies and museums to, uh, to, to do the job so they can have additional staff uh, or additional time to uh, you know, reach appropriate repatriation or disposition um, actions. Other ways may, may be modifying regulations to make, it, to, to make it easier, but of course you've got the, you know, the, the law as it is to uh, to deal with there also. But both both Shelby and John still have their hands up. I'm just wondering if you want to further comment. No. <laughs> okay, well then let's go, let's uh, uh, get a sense if we um, did, did actually the deletion that, that Melanie had just had on her screen and just took down, um, would that be satisfactory for the for the committee? Is this something we want to say to Congress? That without this sentence, without this sentence and the first little phrase in the second the sentence so I want. I, in looking at this section as a barrier, as identifying what a barrier is, I look at if we look at the the paragraph immediately following, there are some parts of the solution are mentioned in that second paragraph of this section, uh, and and in fact in our recommendations where we're where we're advising Congress that. Um, all the parties um, need additional funding, and if and, you know, recommending to Congress provide that additional funding for these kinds of these kinds of activities, which we think will uh, lessen the complexity or lessen the amount of time 
that 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 things take, or give the give the institutions involved the resources to undertake them. So it does hang together in, in that sense. Okay, I don't see anybody else commenting. Oh, honor, yes, honor. Thanks, Frank. Um, I, I kind of support, I think I support uh, John's suggestion that this be phrased in terms of a question. Why hasn't, um, why is NAGPRA compliance um, taking as long as it is um, up the top? Um, I mean, the complications having to do with NAGPRA have a number of barriers that are not insurmountable. Um, so, and we make those in our recommendations, but I, I support what John commented on earlier. Do you, do you want to suggest a different phrase for the beginning, the number two, or are you saying it's okay? Um, John, what was your suggestion on number two? Uh, yes, uh, I was just putting for possible, you know, for consideration, is that more of a, uh, is it more of a question than a, than a statement at, at this point? Uh, and I say that because as Chair has pointed out, I mean, this has been a statement in, in earlier, uh, in, in earlier reports in previous years, I think starting in 2018, somewhere around there, that was the first time, maybe the first time that that was. So we're 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 a few years along in that in 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 having that as a statement, and now uh, the last year's events aside, um, now I mean I, it, it's presenting itself as a question, <laughs> I guess. So what if so what if we rephrase that first bolded sentence as, why is NAGPRA compliance? more complicated than originally envisioned. And we, and we take out that sentence that, that Melanie has struck through. If, if I might make a suggestion, rather than changing this heading, and this report, um, my suggestion would be that, that you start with that question and look to your next report to try to answer why is compliance more complicated than originally envisioned and, and pro provide then um, in your next report some of those barriers that, that might go beyond what you've got identified here? Uh, okay, that, let's take that as a suggestion, but Tim, Tim's raised his hand as well. So let's hear what he has to say. Um, it's not about the text here, but the idea, I think the I think we've all put our finger on a really important topic, the why has this taken so long? And I might recommend that at the next meeting or when we consider those GIO items to look at grants, to look at civil penalties, to look at the review committee, that that be one of the questions too. Because GAO, I think, could get the data to answer this question. that we will never be able to do. Hmm. Uh, an honor, you got a, a comment also? Oh, um, I meant to lower my hand, but I think that's a great suggestion. <laughs> 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 How does that sound then? I, I, I think that's a good, that actually also gives us uh, something instead of just saying, well, GAO should do a report, um, maybe giving some identifying what, what we think a good direction would be for that report to take. You know, and just to add to that, Frank, um, certainly I think we need to hear from um, the public on this as well. Um, and I, I think in the next review committee meeting, it would be good to um, just hear that from public comments. Thanks. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to suggest we uh, do the edit that uh, Melanie's got up on the screen for this section. We we do leave the the bolded text as it is, but that we do uh, highlight this topic as something that, as a committee, we want to try to explore and, and uh, improve upon. Um, as in you know. As as we serve on the committee, one of our one of our objectives. If that's okay, then why don't we keep moving through? That was all of the comments I had. John, yes, I had a a comment. Uh, we scrolled down, but I had a, a comment or something on the the third the third um, the third oh, point. The third, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and namely the uh, the third the third paragraph um, about uh, the um, the potentially sensitive information uh, that or culturally sensitive information that tribes may share, uh, in, you know, in terms of a claim. I know we 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 bullet that out fur, further below. It looks like in recommendations, but I'm not quite un. Uh, I think it may need its its very own short point or bullet point here, because while you're capturing the uh, the need to for reburial purposes, um, it also applies to the other the other areas or categories under repatriation uh, legislation. That, that have to do with return the information or things that tribes might share in terms of, of cultural patrimony or, or potential items that may be that apply to ceremony or, or not just past but also current day practices. And that's why I would, would suggest you know pulling or pulling that out as a separate that portion of it as a, as a separate point. And you can uh, you know basically you can pull out the uh, I think part of it like the last that that last sentence of that paragraph and you can move it into the second you can move it into the second paragraph there. And then, so this, also this, um, I think we need to stress the, the, uh, the, the sharing of sensitive, the sharing of sensitive information. So it doesn't get, while it's certainly important to the, into the reburial process, it's certainly important to all aspects of, all aspects of repatriation, I think deserving of its own, deserving of its own, of its own point, just to reinforce that point. Okay, so specifically, John, the edits you would you would suggest removing the last sentence, the, like the last sentence of that of that of that that of third, the third paragraph, paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and take it into the the second uh, paragraph. Okay, perhaps right before the sentence let, where it says legislation should, uh, and move it there. So now you have all of your. Is that does that do what you suggest? Yes, and maybe if you don't, you I mean you don't perhaps you don't need finally, but but something up up that looks like that. So then you have your you have that information together about. And then for your point about then about the the con the, the about the, the information shared, I, mean, I almost feel like that need that's a we address it further down, as in the mm -hmm. like in the recommendation section. But I think it mean we think we it further needs to be reinforced. I mean it's it's important. I mean I think I mean I think tribal nations or tribal communities see it as a as a barrier, not just yes. I mean first and foremost it's important to the the protection sure. of the of the ancestors, mm -hmm. but also to to past and and, and present in present day. Uh, practices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Shelby, or, or Honor, is your hand up? Yeah. Um, it's just been up for a while, sorry. Go ahead. And then Shelby. Just in that last paragraph, um, I would put a little bit more emphasis on uh, the inability 
to keep sensitive information confidential should be considered a an add significant barrier to reburial, reburial and therefore to repatriation. Okay. Okay, and I think everybody would go along with that. Uh, Shelby and then John. Yeah, I would suggest maybe making this number four. Um, and that way, I think it will emphasize it more. Um, possibly, um, I don't know what we could call it, but maybe number four, um, uh, so, you know, kind of a significant barrier to information sharing is um, um, due to confidentiality issues, or I don't know how to phrase it, but just something where I, I think we could call this out actually as a, a fourth barrier. Um, maybe separate it out somehow. Maybe somebody else might have a better suggestion of, a, of what we could call this. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's John's comment. Yes, uh, thanks for uh, bring uh, thanks for bringing that up, Shelby. And if I if I wasn't uh, explicit in my in my comment or statement there, I really meant to also say that it should it should sit as a as perhaps like a like a like number four or something like that. should should set alone as a as as a point uh, to, to stand out. So I certainly I certainly support that. And thanks for and thanks for that that comment, Shelby. <laughs> So um, go, go ahead. I think Melanie's got a thought there. She's articulating literally in front of our eyes. I was trying to get you guys started on, on how to phrase it in um, sort of a similar way to to the other barriers, which is that you called out what the barrier is. I think you. I think what you've got there. Uh, maybe after unprotected, we do a period. And that's the highlight, and then the next sense sentence begins. Sensitive information develops during NAGPRA consultations, and then it, I think it. I think it flows all right. It's a, it's a more general. Uh, we would we would need to modify the last sentence to um, remove the the uh, barrier to reburial because we've included that now in th what's three and four is a more general statement. How's that? How's that look? I think that does get get the idea. I, I would have maybe one, I think, modest additional um, edit, which would be in the third line, um, the information in the possession of a federal agency may be released under the Freedom of Information Act. I think there might be some situations where it wouldn't be, but it would be very situational. And so it's, you know, we, we do want to, we do want to change to that. Does that look okay? I think that's good. I mean, we do, we, mentioned the sensitive information issue in the in number three related to reburial, but it's it is a more general problem. And I think we've covered that now with with four. Um Shelby and Tim, you Shelby, you got your hand up. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no, okay. Um but I think Tim just raised his hand. Tim. Um I think it would probably be useful to 
put some language in there to sort of illuminate what we mean by sensitive information, what we're talking about. A for example phrase? Yeah. Anybody want to suggest one? I, I think I recall one of John's comments on this section mention of um, information related to certain ceremonies. Yes, maybe for example, something like that or related to objects of cultural patrimony or sacred objects or something like that. Um, Frank, this is Honor. Uh, yes, I had to suggest putting in perhaps some language to, um, you know, guard against looting. Um, as well uh, in this section. So information uh, about burial locations, for instance, should be protected um, <clears throat> to prevent any further looting of those areas. Um, and there's other, you know, ceremonial um, information that might come forward with regard to sacred items and cultural patrimony. So I, I just want to highlight those and we can probably figure out wording to include it. Um, so you'd suggest something in the third paragraph or second paragraph about protection from changing land use and lack of. I'm not sure where it's. I, I, I think, for example, sorry, under four, um, I was looking at the for example in the second sentence there. Um, for example, um, you know, it's not uh, in the purview of the Native American, or, or it's not in the spirit of the law to create um, open opportunities for. Um, looters by divulging specific examples or specific information about burial locations. Um, <clears throat> I think we can maybe work through that depending on how the committee feels. But, and I think there are other, there's other information that, you know, um, is sensitive to uh, tribes, such as ceremonial information that may come into play with ancestors or cultural items um, that um, may have to be divulged in a consultation setting, um, but should not become universal knowledge uh, to the rest of the world. And I think these are the types of things that would fall under sensitive information um, that remains within the intent of the law um, to uh, you know, ensure that indigenous ancestors are repatriated, but also protected from, and communities are protected from um, further uh, trauma done to the community. And as we heard earlier, there was uh, an example of uh, uh, cultural uh, religious beliefs in ensuring that those are also um, maintained for tribes and not disrupted um, on uh, individual journeys um, after burial. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think actually Melanie's managed to capture your your two your two thoughts there. Your example the example regarding burial locations. 
and the ceremonial information. So um, I think that may address uh, Tim's concern or Tim's suggestion rather, not concern really, but giving some sense of what sensitive information is. So I think we're getting pretty close there. John's got a, got a comment. Yes, and the, the part about the, and like, I mean, I was, uh, and yes, well, I had mentioned the, the, the burial part of a minute, and thanks for bringing that on, or thanks for bringing the, those comments up. I was, was really, because uh, that is important post, certainly important post repatriation. I was also thinking about what, the, what discussions what what comes up what could potentially come up in consultation uh, and so I'm and that was my sort of my for example there I'm seeing some of the, the information that's been typed in and I see uh, um, and I see information that says may have to but I would say like like could be could be shared I mean because on the one hand does that I mean I'm saying does that information have to be shared sometimes the in the, the community at, on, at the they feel it has to or they want to share that to move the, you know, certainly to move the repatriation along, you know, unfortunately to, I want to say to however a case is made with a particular institution and they're, they're, they're sharing, they're sharing that, that, that information. So then Mike can, and I guess sort of the, the comment is that, so when they share that, I mean, is it, we certainly don't want that to have to be a caveat that then as we've heard other commenters say, we start the caveat being that it doesn't then, it doesn't, it's not an opportunity then for that to enter into to further public dis discussion or uh, examination because I don't think that's the I don't think that's the intent or that was the intent of the of the repatriation process was then to create an, another uh, feeding ground, if you will, for data for information about tribes and their their past and, and present practices or beliefs. Okay. Um, John, I would just echo that, and it kind of goes to what uh, I mentioned earlier in response to Honor's question on FOIA release, and that is that there is no requirement under NAGPRA for Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations to divulge sensitive information. There is there's no requirement um, of that information to be shared. There is a requirement to consult and tribes can decide what information they will share in consultation, um, but it is certainly not uh, required to be to be shared, nor certainly is it required to be written down. All right, have we got um, a text that everybody is comfortable with at this point where we've covered the, the ground and got our ideas across? Okay. Why don't, we, why don't we take a look at the recommendations, Melanie, if you want to scroll down. Uh, so again, these are using the same uh, recommendations as we have in the, uh, in the executive summary but providing some additional information regarding what, what, they, what, what we think would be needed to carry them out or undertake them or, or something like that. Um, and and we, I guess, I was gonna say we have to change one, but we don't, because we didn't have, we haven't, we didn't make any modifications in the executive summary. To these. So if we if we still like the the headings here, the, the bolded text uh, we, that are consistent with what's in the executive summary, and uh, again the the text below it is supportive of the of those recommendations. Our honor. Uh Frank, um, just with regard to two, where it says increased funding and professional staffing for programs and federal agencies that are responsible for agency compliance with NAGPRA. Um, I'd also suggest, because we've heard this in several um, committee presentations, that there be something in there about creating uh, NAGPRA line items in the budget 
And the reason for that is it makes it easier to track how the agencies are spending money um, on NAGPRA individually. Um, and then more data can be uh, gathered from that that will be informative to the public um, and to the review committee um, and also with compliance. I, I, let me just, I, I think I have a, a little bit of an experiential comment here uh, on that particular uh, thought, which I agree with you. It's a good, it's a good idea in terms of anybody being able to monitor how much funding is going into this particular activity. The, the problem, um, well, the pushback we would get for, would come in part from the agencies because they, they deal with, as at an agency level, they deal with larger buckets of money, not to be crass about it, but you know, there, there may be a cultural resource management fund from which lots of different activities are drawn. And there may be a law enforcement fund within say the National Park Service or the Department of the Interior from which lots of different programs are funded. And in some cases, a program like NAGPRA might actually have several different of funding, funding coming from several of these different sources. So it's, uh, it's difficult uh, to do that administratively within an agency's budget system. Not impossible, um, but it also, I think, tends to be much larger amounts of money than we're talking and we're probably talking about that would be made available for, for NAGPRA to do that. So um, we, we could say, uh, I, to sort of get at your, at your concern, something about um, it being important that how, this, how, much of the, how much this money, or how this money is being utilized within the agency or something like that. Let me ask our DFO in terms of current uh, budgets, what we know about current budgets, say within the National Park Service, as to whether that specific a level of uh, tracking of funding is, it can, could be implemented in your experience and observation, um, not as recommendation. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, um, I don't have a lot of experience in how the National Park Service carries out its responsibilities for implementation of NAGPRA. My responsibilities are the administration of NAGPRA um, and implementation by National Park Service units and the National Park Service as a land managing agency is completely separate. Right, yeah, okay. Um, Frank, just to, and, and Melanie, I remember that, I think it was Emily Paulus, I can't recall, but I made a presentation or has made presentations in the past on this issue. And I'm looking, I don't mean to put her on the spot, but I'm looking in the participant list and was wondering if she might be able to just repeat um, briefly um, what she had presented before to us about that topic. It was at the Fairbanks meeting, I think, I remember that. I don't know technically whether that's possible. Um, yes, it is possible. Emily, you can speak. Sure. Um, I am not wholly prepared uh, because I'm, uh, but I will say that at the Fairbanks meeting, uh, in giving a presentation for the Department of Interior Interior Museum Program, uh, um, sharing information on department-wide uh, museum collections issues and addressing um, areas of intersection with museum collections management and agency responsibilities for NAGPRA, I gave some examples of that work and also spoke to funding. And in my presentation, I provided a slide that um, where I identified that no none of the Department of Interior 
bureaus had a specific line item for NAGPRA, but I offered a proxy, which is not the same thing as a, here's what's spent on NAGPRA, but I gave what is what bureaus report to have spent on their museum programs. And I apologize that my cat is meowing in the background. Again, I was not prepared. <laughs> um, that presentation was shared with the review committee. Uh, so it is a part of meeting, the meeting materials uh, from the Fairbanks meeting. And I could, uh, in the next few moments, pull up that presentation and share it again with Melanie. So it's quick at your fingertips. Uh, but I will say to Frank's point, Mr. Chair, um, that most of the agencies have a large, have a general activity budget like cultural resources from within which multiple activities are, um, are, are funded. So for instance, the Bureau of Land Management where I worked before my current role, we had the cultural resource management subactivity, which covered archaeology, historic preservation, tribal coordination, paleontology, museum collections, and NAGPRA. So to, to um, Ms. Keeler, your point that it is hard to tease out from, um, from the, the green books or the, the president's budget and the agency budget justifications, um, it's hard to tease out the specific allocations for NAGPRA, that, that being funds that are made available for NAGPRA work, and then what's actually obligated to NAGPRA work. But I can pull out, out that material and, and resurface it if that is useful. And then also to say, that the reason that I can report on how much the Department of Interior bureaus and offices spend on museum collections management activities is because my office asks. It's as simple as that. They, we ask as part of our oversight responsibilities and they respond. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Emily. So um, to get back to the to the to the point, um, we're one of the recommendations is to increase funding and staffing. Um, at the very end of that paragraph, we might add a short sentence that says something like, um, "It will be important to monitor um, the use of these funds," or agencies should be directed to report on this use of these funds or use of funding, use of funds to implement NAGPRA. Thanks, Frank. I, I like that wording. That do it? Okay. Tim, you got a comment? Uh, report annually. Thank you. Other comments on the recommendations? If not, and I appreciate that, um, the last, the the next, the last two parts are the are uh, just the uh, NAGPRA uh, National NAGPRA program um, statistics, which we, which will be attached. So, uh, Madam DFO, we I think we have a a text for our annual report now that the uh, review committee has agreed upon as a whole in a public session. Do we need some kind of a, a vote to proceed with that, or is it sufficient that we've done this and we can move forward with um, with the version with the changes as discussed 
and as you've carefully noted, um, and proceed to uh, send our report to the department for review and approval, and then ultimately to Congress. Um, yes. Um, yes, we need to vote, or yes, we can <laughs> move forward. Well, I was just going to say, um, uh, we don't necessarily need a formal vote. Um, we can certainly proceed by consensus. Um, in, in all decision making, um, in this committee could proceed by consensus um, or, or general agreement. Um, how would you like to proceed, Mr. Chair? Uh, uh, I suggest we proceed by consensus, which we have. And uh, I would thank all the members for their attention to this particular uh, part of our part of our activities and uh, in particular, the, uh, the subcommittee that worked together on uh, putting the, the drafts, the various drafts and sundry together. And to Melanie and to Lisa and to others on the, uh, on the, the NAGPRA, National NAGPRA staff who supplied information that we asked for and uh, have helped uh, just administratively put the document together. So congratulations on us all. We'll move forward um, with it. Yeah, I'll just ask if any committee members would like to um, note an objection to the report for the record. Okay, then uh, I will proceed to um, prepare the report for transmittal to Congress. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, we have about 30 minutes. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Frank, this is Honor. Go ahead. Yep. Just before we get going, um, Melanie, can you give us uh, an update on whether Congress received our 2019 report? Um, yes, I can give you an update. Um, no, Congress has not received your 2019 report to Congress. Uh, could you also comment on what the holdup there might be? Um, I don't. No, um, all I can tell you is that it has it is with the department um, for review and uh, signature of the cover letter. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Tim. Um, Melanie, could you tell us who in the department has this? Uh, I do not know. Because I might ask um, Frank, in your position as chair, um, the FY19, 2018-2019 report to Congress was approved by this committee on October the 30th of two years ago, two years ago. It's been languishing somewhere in the department, and that is unacceptable. This is our report. This report should be sent timely to the Congress. And I would ask you, in your capacity as chair, to do whatever you can going forward to ensure both that the FY19 report and this report gets sent and not in a year or six months but in a timely fashion because it is it is an embarrassment not only to the committee but to the department and to this secretary that mm -hmm. that report has not been sent and no one can tell us where it is or will tell us where it is so i want to make sure that we know that our this committee's 2019 report has been held hostage for over two years. Uh, I will do what I'm able to do, Tim, in this uh, new capacity that you've uh, that the other members and, and you have uh, uh, placed me in, and. Uh, I'll talk maybe in more detail with with Melanie 
about what we might do, because I agree with you. And I think I think other members of the committee agree with you in terms of the, the languishing of the, of the earlier report. And we've just spent a lot of our time and we spent a great deal of time before this particular meeting in putting together our own report. And uh, we would like that report and our ideas to get to Congress where hopefully it will have some effect. So uh, it is a serious it, problem. Uh, I would Overcome. suggest, um, Frank, if you would like to send me an email to that effect of, of uh, requesting, I will send that on then to uh, the person in the National Park Service who manages our controlled correspondence. Okay. All right, that'll be a start. All right, um, any other comments? from the committee on that particular matter or uh, other things we've talked about today so far? Um, so I, I did want to mention that there was a public comment that was submitted in the chat. Um, it is quite lengthy and um, I would I would actually like to ask if we could have that person come forward and, and read their comment. Um, Yes, I guess we can, can can consider that new business, can we? I think it would be a revisiting the public comment opportunity. Okay, well, why don't we why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay, um, uh, Ms. Fitzgibbons, you have uh, posted a, a comment. Um, if you if you would raise your hand, um, I will allow you to to access to your microphone. Um, I don't see her raising her hand. Um, just for everyone's information, only um, only the committee can see the comments. They're not uh, they're not sent to everyone. Um, the chat only comes to the the panelists. Um, Okay, well, rather than read the statement, I guess uh, if if the individual doesn't want to make a public comment, um, I can copy and paste this into a document and share it as a, a written comment for the committee. That would be that would be great. I think that's probably the way to to proceed. And okay, we will accept then that this as just a, taking a quick look at the uh, the at least the first part of that. Of that comment, there's some concern about the Stop Act and the, the specific details of the Stop Act. Although the organization that she's associated with, I think, is what she's saying is the organization supports the goals of the of the law. I think our recommendation about it also was only at that level, the goals of the law, and not the individual details in the law. But I appreciate knowing uh, from her. I would appreciate the committee knowing from her. The uh, uh, what detail? If there's particular details that, that are are troubling, or that, that the uh, the ATADA finds troubling, that it'd be good to know about those. So, um, Melanie, if you could do that, that would be great, and then make that available to the committee members. Yes, we will <laughs> accept this as a written comment for you to consider at your next meeting. Okay. So thanks, thanks to Kate Fitzgibbon for uh, pointing pointing these things out to us. So the other thing that we wanted to, or well, but we've got old business or new business. If I could just um, interject again, if, if there's anyone else who, who would like to make a public comment, um, you can raise your hand or, or post. So we do have a raised hand here. You can see on the bottom of my screen, Veronica yes. Petfield. Mm -hmm. uh, Veronica, you can unmute. Ani, um, 
Veronica Passfield, Indigenous Cost, Kenoje Conning, and Dota Bendaguas. I'm Veronica Passfield. I'm an anchor officer for my tribe, Bay Mills Indian Community. And I've been working on NAGPRA officially as a tribal rep since 2010. I actually presented before the NAGPRA review committee in 2010 about issues we were having with University of Michigan, which happily did resolve. I just wanted to encourage you to please really seriously consider um, GAO accountability or um, you know um, investigations, if you will, how, please, we get really stuck. You know, we have some, a situation that just came up that um, I don't have enough information to talk about yet, but people are, suffice it to say that we still have top tier research institutions who are uh, still resistant to their NAGPRA obligations. So please do seriously consider that. We need that help from you. It would save us a lot of time from having to prepare to come before you. Um, and additionally, please let us know how we can support you in, in, in um, demonstrating that there is a real need for this. So we have so much, as you know, knowledge and experience around our particular situations amassed if there is a way that aggregating things or having representative situations, um, but we are here for you, just like you are trying to be here for us. Mio, miigwech. Veronica, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, so, um, Madam DFO, we have other business we could at least get started on. Um, is anybody, any member of the committee have something they want to raise or honor? Uh, thank you, Veronica, for bringing that forward. Uh, we certainly, as a committee, encourage uh, hearing um, issues uh, and information that might be needed in such a GAO investigation. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, as we talked about earlier, um, that this will be something to focus upon in our future meetings. Um, so anyone who's attending, um, please please bring that forward to the committee. These are these are important issues. And what oh, thank you. Thanks, Honor. So, uh, Madam DFO, at this point, do we um, ask the committee if they have any old business or any new business that individuals want to discuss? Is that the way to proceed? Yes, certainly. Okay. Committee members, is there old business or new business that you would like to discuss or begin to discuss? We have about 15 minutes left in this, this meeting, this call. Tim. Um, I think we also need to um, finalize the meeting procedures. We we do, I believe, but I think that's in the next in the next meeting's agenda. Is that right, Melanie? Oh, is that right? Um, no, no, it's not. Um, we do need to final. Well, um, the committee finalized the review the procedures, the meeting procedures. Um, I then made some some edits, um, and I will work with the chair um, to um, to accept those edits and, and sign the procedures. So we've done that. We did that in August on the 18th, I think. We did the final agreement on that, okay. Yeah, there is a copy of, of both um, the final mm. um, procedures approved by the committee in August, as well as the the draft that I made changes to. Um, Tim, are you? would you like to discuss those changes? Is that what you're saying? Um, I think there was only one that sort of caught my eye and it was the issue about um, consulting between the DFO and the chair. And I think there was, I think you had put some language in there when practical. And 
I would prefer it not say in when practical, that, that that's just a requirement. Do we want to look at that? <clears throat> Are you able to see that? Yes. So, yes. Point six. Mm -hmm. Is that where it is? Right. And I would just prefer to strike the addition of to the extent practical comma and retain the original sentence that the chair and the DFO will consult. Um, well, I, I can explain the change. Um, obviously, in preparing the agenda for this meeting, uh, there was not a chair with whom I could consult. Uh, there may be other situations um, where I am not able to consult with the chair, and I would um, not want that to prevent us from moving forward with an agenda and a meeting. But Melanie, just to play a little devil's advocate here, there's there's not a requirement to add that particular phrase. Is that, is that correct? Well, actually, there there's a requirement in the charter um, that I, as the DFO, prepare and approve all agendas. So I need to be able to carry out that responsibility given to me in the charter. Um, whether or not there is a chair with whom I can consult. And we, we now actually have a vice chair also, in part because we were concerned about that sort of a situation, which has and, arisen obviously in the past. And, and, and I, I agree that the procedures will require uh, the DFO to consult whenever practical. Uh, I just, I need there to be provision here for when it is not practical, when it cannot occur that I can still carry out my responsibilities under the charter. Um, I might have a suggestion, Frank. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe instead of saying to the extent pra practical that we say the chair and the DFO will consult on the meeting agenda. Um, and then afterward say if the chair um, is uh, unable to do so, then the vice chair will fulfill these duties. Although I think that is something that we've already put um, above this. Um, so it might, might where the, the vice chair takes over the chair duties. Yeah, that's, that's, in, that's covered here. So if, if there were not a chair, um, certainly the DFO would consult with the vice chair um, and on that responsibility. But I, I need there to be a way that we can move forward here with meetings and agendas where uh, it is impossible um, for for the DFO to consult with the chair. Well, I just think that we've we've tried to um, create that by establishing a vice chair position. At this point, could you give an example of where that might happen? Sure. Um, so obviously, we have a requirement um, under um, FACA. Uh, to provide an agenda 15 days before a meeting. Um, while certainly we would make every effort uh, to try to complete an agenda before then, if a chair was a chair and a vice chair were incapacitated, on vacation, unable to respond to emails, I need to meet those requirements to post an agenda and to prepare an agenda. And, oh. and I'm not, I just need that out here. That's all I'm asking for is, is some op option here for, for me to carry out the responsibilities I have. Well, in fact, you did in the, the yes. agenda for this meeting and the agenda for the next meeting. 
Yes. There wasn't any chair. Exactly. Chair. So that's my concern here. If if we put in the procedures that this is a requirement for me, and I can't do it, what what would the committee have me do? Would cancel meetings because I'm not able to consult with the chair on an agenda? No, we wouldn't. We did it actually um, because we had an administrative meeting to some extent. You consulted with everybody on that, although I think that the agendas were out before that. But well, but yes, that's exactly right. I I, I definitely tried to consult with everybody in the absence of a chair with whom I could consult. Yeah, to the extent that, as you have explained it, um, that this clause would only apply when the chair and the vice chair are both simultaneously unavailable. And that is the limited nature of this clause. Is that correct? Yes. I, I guess answer. I, yes. That, that's why I put to the extent practical in case there was some barrier to that being practical. That's satisfactory, Tim. It's, uh, that, that phraseology is a little mushy, but I think with this clarification, I can live with that. Okay, good, good. Thank you, Honor, you have a comment. Uh, sorry, so is the clarification to add that uh, another phrase to erase to the extent practical and add another phrase about if the chair and vice chair are absent then, or is it to maintain to the extent practical for this specific reason? Um, I would prefer that it were, it were mushy um, to allow for uh, other instances that I can't come up with right now, uh, I guess. I, again, um, I don't want this to prevent a meeting from occurring, this requirement. So that, I guess that mushy phrase uh, is is a, a way of allowing me to move forward um, when I cannot consult with the chair or the vice chair. John. Oh, you're muted, John. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I, I uh, tend to, uh, with how the statement is proven, we've had some discussion on it. We don't want to paralyze the. We don't want to paralyze the process. Uh, we have meetings in advance. We usually have a pretty good idea of what the agenda is going to be. Uh, we sort of again, we certainly don't want to paralyze the process. If the if the past eighteen months have taught us anything, we need to be ready for anything. I think this gets us ready for, uh, or that allows allows some leeway there uh, to. So the DFO, so the, the NAGPRA office can do what they need to do to, to schedule to schedule meetings. Thank, thank you, John. Any other comments from the members? I'm sorry, I, I just- oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Honor, then Tim. Um, I think it's important to uh, be specific here. Uh, I have a little bit of a problem with um, blaming the incapacity of the NAGPRA review committee's at, um, attendance at a meeting on the chair or lack of a chair, um, if the DFO had that capacity uh, before that to create the agenda in the meeting. So I just think we need to think about this carefully. I don't think the intent is to incapacitate the review committee, but to ensure that the we're in compliance with the law and our charter and um, that these meetings do move forward with the agenda items decided upon by the chair and the DFO. Thanks, Honor. Tim? Um. I think what this is like contract negotiation we've just done. We've we're dealing with a phrase, and we don't necessarily have to come and change the phrase. 
as long as we all agree on what it means. And I think what Melanie just told us, well, I think what she said was this, this would apply to situations where both the chair and the vice chair are simultaneously unavailable to her in order for her to carry out her duties. And if that is the meaning here, I can agree to that language. If we all agree, that's what this means. I can agree with that. These Honor. are called negotiation notes. Okay. Honor, does that, given that, that uh, clarification, would you be satisfied with the, the current text as drafted? Yes, given that specific clarification, that's helpful. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Shelby. I I concur. I think I think having an understanding of what the wording means is very helpful. And I would I would say I would go forward and approve the language here. Thank you. Okay. All right. So. Uh, I just want to be oh. Yeah, I also agree as well. To leave Thank you, in. Barnaby. I was just looking for your for your icon there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Tim, you got another comment? Oh, you just had your hand. Okay. All right, then I think we're I think we're um, I think we're good with that uh, that one adjustment and with the uh, fuller understanding based upon this discussion. We also run out the clock. Um, before we adjourn, however, I do uh, want to say that one thing I wanted to bring up as new business is uh, to begin our more detailed discussion uh, of the draft proposed uh, regulation changes. This is something we had talked about doing in our administrative meeting, and we've simply run out of time, which is unfortunate. Um, I would like to work then with the DFO on putting it into formally into the agenda for meeting 74. Right now, uh, it's we would again be doing it under new business or old business. I'm not sure which that would be. And I know that meeting is already pretty packed, but um, I think we need to start this process. I think all of us agreed this was going to be quite a lengthy process, uh, the way we had talked about doing it by going through from front to back. But um, I think it's important. Um, in, in that regard, before we do adjourn also, uh, uh, Madam DFO, any updates uh, from you on uh, where we are with the, where you are, where the department is with those regulations? We, we have seen copies now of a couple of very detailed copies of comments that the department received uh, from um, some of the Native American organizations concerned. Uh, are there other comments that have come in from other uh, tribal organizations or from individual tribes that we should be looking at or uh, just exactly what's happening? Um, sure, thank you. Um, I'd be happy to give you an update. Um, as, as the committee knows, um, the department released a draft text in July of uh, the regulations and initiated consultation with Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. That consultation was conducted in August. On our website, on the National Park Service NAGPRA website, you can find transcripts of that consultation, um, of those, those four consultation sessions. Um, <clears throat> written comments were due to the department on September 30th. The department received many um, comments from Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations by that deadline of September 30th. Uh, we received over 70 um, individual wow. comment letters. The department is still reviewing that input from Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations before it announces what the next step is in the process with these regulations. So at this time, there is no um, announcement about the direction the department is taking on um, the, the next steps in the process until it has thoroughly reviewed and considered input from Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations.
Thank you. Any comments from review committee members on regulations or our review of drafts of the regulations? All right. Well, um, before we adjourn, I uh, I want to thank you all for selecting me as the chair. I appreciate your, I, I guess, your confidence that I can do this in an objective and reasonable way. I will certainly try to do that and uh, look forward to our, our next meeting as okay. well. Please, please feel free to contact me if anything, if, uh, if need be. I have a question, Frank. Um, yes. Melanie. Uh, Melanie, thanks for all you've done for this uh, committee this time around. Um, has there been any indication about when our position, our missing position on the committee might be filled? Um, no, I haven't heard any more since I submitted um, the nominations that we received. Thank you. That update. And Melanie, I'll be getting an email to you. Okay, thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you all. We can adjourn this meeting and we will uh, reconvene on uh, November 23rd uh, for another uh, review committee meeting. Okay, are, are we adjourned? We are adjourned. Okay. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs> Take care. Would anyone Happy, like to object? A lot of reading no. to do before the next meeting. <laughs> thank you all. Take care. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone.